Um, you, you just mentioned it's some of the things you're writing, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, take us through that step by step. How do you write? How, what do you feel when you write? Because I've been writing a lot too lately. Like yesterday, I spent four hours straight writing something. Oh, really? And I, I'll tell you about how I felt and every time I feel. But tell me about like your process of why write? How do you think when you write? Is there a pre-writing ritual What's going on there? <laughs> Super interesting, right? Because I think writing is our creating the future. And it's been said, you know, the pen is mightier than the sword and, and so on. It is the narrative that we are passing on to the future generation, you know, or people beyond us. So our ability to articulate our ideas allows those ideas to spread. And it always starts with a good script. So that's what we've been working on with Gasm is this script of rewriting several thousand years of repressed sexuality. So for me, writing is key to creating the identity that I want in the world. Although I can't really create my own identity because the identity is going to be whatever way I show up. It is us it is each person's opportunity to express, you know, the throat chakra is like expression and creativity. This is us creating and we are creating not only the story that we're passing on to other people because we feel that it's important or valuable and it's been important and valuable for us, but it's something that we're uh, creating in the world. It's, it's, a, it's a thought form that we're putting out into the world. And it goes very deep on multiple levels, and I can really get into a lot of it. Um, for me, in a way, um, we are, as we write and express, we are, again, creating a future, a story into which somebody can drop into. If you notice the thoughts of the mind, they're all stories, stories that we tell about ourselves and stories that we tell about others. We're creating new realities by bringing out different ideas and thoughts and the use of digital media and, you know, what used to be the, you know, printed book, but now it's digital media. We're able to spread those stories far and wide. My personal process is in flux, I experiment with different things. I would say one of the most important principles that I have around things that I teach are things that are things that I've experienced myself firsthand, because I can talk about things that other people have written and I've kind of synthesized into a different narrative in my own mind, but it is coming from me when it's coming from me as something that I feel I'm very passionate about. It has to be something that I have experienced firsthand. It could be a cool idea. It could be something fun and interesting, but when I've personally done the experiment to see what actually works and seen that it does work, that's what I want to pass on to others. And so also that's what I look for from others when I'm looking for a teacher is what have they actually learned firsthand? Because I think a lot of what we receive in terms of stories are digests of other people's stories. So what we receive in the news, what we receive uh, in the press are people reporting on, and it's always coming with some form of interpretation from the person who's conveying it. So what is information? It gets down to the philosophy of what is information and what is, an, and what is experience. And information really, I feel, doesn't exist as a thing. Like, I'm going to get some information. It's always coming through from a person's perspective and being conveyed as a story. So the nature and structure and philosophy of stories are very... Vast, I would say they're very, um, uh, not just complex, but um, there's a lot of nuance and aspects to it. 
So we're conveying stories. We're also hearing stories. Just as we, and you know, your avid health, uh, you know, you take care of your body, you take care of the food that you put into your body. We also have to be very conscious of the, the thoughts that we bring into our minds because that becomes the structure of our minds. And again, these are the stories that we're told. So what I've realized through my own experience is that probably, and again, these are you know numbers that have just come to me, but I would say like 98% of what we've been told is only partially true, which makes it almost useless. So I feel like what we're walking around in the world in is a Hollywood set something that's been constructed. But if you look behind these walls, you'll find that that, those realities don't actually exist. Created by corporations to sell products, to make us believe certain things about ourselves. And so we have to become very competent. One of the things that I want to, that I like writing about, and one of the things that I'm focused on writing about, are how to discern what is real and how to discern what is uh, you know created for somebody else's benefit. And so we were really presented with a lot of those illusions from all sides during COVID. And it was really a, a massive lesson, I feel, for people to go through that gauntlet of information, call it, from different perspectives. And for people really to start distinguishing between what is real and what is not real. Can I even tell what is real? Again, I feel like it comes back to what we can experience firsthand. So we've all experienced or heard both sides of these, you know, the vaccine, anti-vax stories, right? And um, it comes down to like, how do we know for sure? Right. These are giant experiments. And so it's up to us each as individuals to do the experiment. And there is no ap- like absolute objective reality. Like, yeah, it appears that we're both at this table right now. And we're both having two totally different experiences. Your background of experience is completely different than mine. There's some commonalities and we do our best at communicating through words, but truly the experience of your life and your, from your history and your perspective in this moment is completely different than mine. So the best that we can do is convey what's been powerful for us in the best words that we can come up with, use metaphors and things of common language and do our best to tell these stories. So, yeah, life is life is storytelling. Life is life is creating reality through the stories that we tell. It's the words of Martin Luther King that created that possibility for that movement. It's the words of the founding fathers and the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution that created the reality that created this opportunity to be in this particular country, right? And so on. So it is that power of of writing. And then writing, of course, persists beyond our actually speaking it. And so it's a way to put these ideas into form. And then those forms become thought energy. And then those thought energies, as we can get into when we get into things like family constellation, those thought energies show up in other people's bodies and minds, not just as thoughts and concepts, but as feelings in their bodies and minds. When certain stories are repeated over and over again and enough people hear it, it becomes part of their energy system through the through the spoken and written word, but also propagated in what I'll call the collective unconscious. And it's, it's really freaky and interesting. (laughs) But um, yeah, so what I would say is back to my process. I've been experimenting with some interesting processes right now. Um, I've been tapping into AI. And I've been taking notes during morning meditation as if it's like a morning pages. 
but I've been taking notes as voice notes. And then I drop it into an AI and have an AI turn all of those voice notes into prompts to go deeper into the questions and ideas that I'm proposing. And I have the AI riff off of the ideas and, and educate me. So basically at the beginning of my meditation, instead of having a ton of thoughts that just like get burned on the fire of knowledge, I put them into a voice note. And then after a while, I don't have any more thoughts and then I can really be present in meditation. But those voice notes end up being seeds of projects or uh, aspects of the GASA map or things that I need to be aware of or an area of exploration that I want to dive into to get a little bit more educated. And I, I drop it into an AI and the AI like turns it into a ton of um, asks, like bigger asks of AI. So it, it then is like my morning after meditation, I can go through all of the insights that I've had in meditation and get the answers from an AI to what those insights are. Can you give us an example? Sure. So I was asking the question, so I've been be vegan for coming up on six years and I always uh, have a lot of fun with my kids, especially my son Zane, who's, who's always challenging me. And he's like, yeah, dad, you know, why don't you have some meat? And I'm like, he's like, I know, uh, you know, of course that, you know, plants experience pain as well. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah. Apparently, apparently plants are experiencing pain too. So it's like, but I know Hinduism makes a distinction between, uh, you know, eating plants and eating animals. And so in meditation, I'm like, what is the Hindu philosophy around eating plants and animals? And how do they make a distinction between sentient beings and plants? Because they're claiming plants aren't sentient. And so, yeah, that became a prompt and a whole like two page long explanation from an AI as to what the Hindu philosophy is around plants and animals and eating them and what is sentience. Got it. So the prompt, because from when you first explained it, I had a feeling that the prompt is back to you. So, for example, imagine uh, you're meditating or doing breath work and a thought enters like like, for example, today, as I was meditating, uh, I ordered a bunch of bulbs from uh, Amazon, you know, 40 watt, 100 watt, just playing with all sorts of like there's a ring light there in the back, just playing around. And um, the thought was like, I'm not going to use all of these bulbs. So should I just return it or should I like just keep it right? So this thought entered sure. now it's, it's kind of like a useless thought, but to me, thoughts aren't usually they're not useless. Like it, yeah, we may not know where the thought came from. You know, like Sam Harris always says, Oh, we don't know where thoughts come from. Thoughts come from somewhere. Nobody knows where. So when this type of thought enters, my process is I trust myself to have that thought come later when it's the right time. Sure. Right. So, for example, right now, you know, like after our podcast, if this thought entered, I would come here, I would write it down like, OK, um, these are the bulbs I have. These are this is what I'm not using. And then I can probably return this or you know what? I'll, I'll keep it for a couple of weeks. Let's see. Let's see if I let, let's see if there's any use for it. But what, what, when you were talking about the prompts, I thought I could make a voice note, give it to AI, I'm assuming chat GPT or something close and say, give me back prompts so I can dig deeper into my soul and think deeper about these questions. And then if I don't know, then I can ask AI and he'll give me the answer or, or, or I'll look it up yeah. somewhere. Yeah, it's all in there for sure. I mean, the idea with morning pages, are you familiar with morning pages? So yeah, the idea just, if anybody is not familiar with morning pages, morning pages are, you know, get out all the thoughts and, and things that occur in the mind when you first wake up. And then um, it's also related to this principle that thoughts are incomplete communication. So when you express your thoughts and they're fully received by another, 
they lose all their weight in the mind and you can get to a place of no mind, right? So I found in meditation, if I just allow thoughts to go, they're still like, oh, there's something subconscious there for me to remember. But when I do the voice note, it could be a voice note like you're saying, hey, what about the freaking light bulbs? Or it could be like, what is the sentient being according to Hindu philosophy, right? But it's getting it out and it's being received now by the other being the AI. So I have a note for it later. So I can know that I don't need to think about that and it'll be handled at some point. And it, I go take it into the AI and it literally comes out as a list of action items for me to... So, you know, the light bulb thing would be there. The, you know, ask about this, ask about this, ask about this, you know, do this other thing and so on. It becomes a checklist of things that I can just knock out. But it does, um, it does, I mean, I think my difference with like Sam Harris, since I've done a lot of family constellations, is that thoughts don't necessarily come from nowhere. Like we don't know where thoughts come from. I think there is really good evidence that thoughts are in a, a thought sphere and in a collective unconscious. And there's something that resonates through us and comes up then in the conscious mind as a thought. And um, yeah, you can experience that all the time in a family constellation where somebody else's experience is coming through my body and then comes up into my mind as a thought. And I've just had way too many crazy what would sound like coincidences according to materialism or sam harris's perspective that would be just oh that's a coincidence but you, when you have too many of them it, it's it just becomes irrefutable like there's evidence through one's own experience although not written down in a scientific paper although not measured with a scientific instrument we are the instrument this body is an antenna. This body mind is an antenna for consciousness. When you really get into it and you start experiencing it a lot, we are the experimenters and we are the experiment. Mm. Going back to Socrates a bit. So you, you mentioned stories and you mentioned this art of writing things down or uh, in this, you know, the voice note is a different thing because that's auditory, but writing things down. Socrates never wrote anything down. And his claim was that writing, and obviously I'm paraphrasing here, uh, writing sort of bastardizes the process of communication. So what he would do is he would just do the Socratic seminars. Plato would write things down and other students would write things down that Socrates said. But he himself was of the idea that writing itself will make it sort of make you lazy because now that you've written it it doesn't have to be here and here right it's like oh i'll, I'll deal with this later or this is for the future or this is for a future gen for future generation so and and obviously you know socrates is one of the greatest philosophers that ever that ever lived so then how do you reconcile his perspective on writing makes things like diluted right a, a bit um it doesn't make it as strong as it used to be or as meaningful as it used to be like for example you and i are talking right now okay and right now this thing is being recorded now imagine someone read the transcript of it or saw the video of it or there was a bunch of people here listening at the same time how do you reconcile all that? Like, is Socrates wrong, or is he? Does he have his own perspective that is not per, doesn't pertain to today's world? Because there was people were writing then too. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I love uh, the idea of a of a dialogue, right? And it's engaging with another being. It's engaging with another person. Typically, a person could be an animal, could be a plant, I guess, but. Um, uh, could be a rock, could be an object. So we, we have these energies. And I think the materialistic view of the world that we've gotten into with like Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, um, that we are meat bags. And that, you know, when this life ends, we will turn into dust and there will be nothing left. Like consciousness is emerging from the meat bag. And... 
I think there are a bunch of problems with that model, and it's essentially, to me, an incomplete model. And I think there are much more uh, holistic models. I don't think there's any model that is probably ever been articulated that is it does include the totality of reality, but there are better ones. It's like we have different maps to the terrain, but it's still not the same as walking through the terrain. Like uh, we're in Tulum right now. I can hand you my map of Tulum and you'll get a little bit of an idea of what my view of Tulum looks like. And then you could hand somebody your map of Tulum and they would get your view a little bit. But in, in those two maps, they would still not have any idea what Tulum is really like until they experience it themselves. So what Socrates, I feel, was saying is sometimes these written words become almost sensed as what I was talking about earlier, as information, as, as the facts of what Socrates said or what Plato wrote down of what Socrates said. And thankfully, we have those today. And thankfully, you know, we have some idea of, of the energy of the dialogue that he was in in his Socratic dialogues, but it's still not the energy of Socrates in a dialogue with another being because we're not just meat bags, but we have um, bioelectric energy around us, right? For one, if, if, if we look at a more complete model of what being a human is like, we should look at the different bodies. You know, when you look at, um, when you look at kind of esoteric science, there's the physical body, there's the energy body, there's the, um, yeah, etheric body, mental body, causal body, and I'm probably forgetting a bunch of them in there, right? But these different bodies connect up and down uh, and, and relate to the physical body. But if we're just focused on the physical body, we're going to be missing a whole lot. Western science, Western medicine especially, would have us believe that we're chemicals and plumbing, Right. And when we realize that emotion has a lot to do with chronic disease and we deal with the underlying emotions and whatever has been repressed to cause an energy stagnation to create a, a lack of healing in a particular physical area, then we can get a much ho more holistic view of healing, right? And um, when we take into account the will of the doctor and the will of the patient, what is placebo is the will of the patient to say, I want to heal from this or I believe this will heal me. And that has a huge effect. I mean, some medicines today aren't even as good as placebo, right? And you hear of people having miracle cures. You hear people uh, doing alternate treatments and again, totally counter to what would be medical advice according to science. But as you know, some of the top neuroscientists would say the published science around neuroscience, 50% of it is inaccurate. So science, the whole idea of science is that it's constantly evolving. And so when we say, just look at the science, it's like, yeah, but it's, it's, always evolving and half of it's not correct, either due to bias, due to poor data collection, due to um, uh, interpretation errors, all sorts of things, right? So, so science is not information. It is not fact. It is, it is a lot of interpretation based upon some data points. Some data points may be inaccurate. Some data points may be, you know, uh, not a complete sample, you know, all of these things. Health and nutrition information a lot of times contradicts itself all the time. Like one week it's, you know, okay, one decade it's like a low fat diet and the next decade it's a high fat diet. Like did, did science change? Did, did facts change? Did material reality change? Or is it just an incomplete model? Maybe biased data, maybe, maybe, you know, certain stories repeated for corporate's benefit, right? So we really have to become the experimenters ourselves. 
It's like down to diet. Okay, maybe a vegan diet works for me, but I'm not going to tell somebody else to do a vegan diet. Like, and if they're eating meat, that's their choice. It's like everybody's got to experiment from themselves. Just like we're different on the outside, we're different on the inside and different needs at different times and all sorts of things. It's not like I'm even fixed. I've gone from being vegetarian to eating meat to being eating fish to being raw vegan to eating meat to being vegan, but a you know a vegan with like high quality fats and you know it's like different. Like even putting labels on things, it becomes a shorthand. So I can see what Socrates is saying. These stories that we wrap things into um, when it's not in a dialogue, when it's not in this conversation we're, that we're having. Uh, there isn't a question. There isn't like a going deeper to get better understanding. Obviously, people watching this can be kind of passive watchers of a dialogue, and that's a benefit. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to have access to a lot of really interesting thoughts, a lot of really interesting stories. But um, yeah, I mean, I definitely feel face to face and being in person is way different than just, you know living in a virtual world yeah you mentioned um so many great things about science and what perhaps can't be measured so when we look at the different we looked at the material body and then you talked about five or six other bodies right energy right. body and and uh, ethereal and so on so can you imagine a time in the future when everything can be measured. So in other words, just because it cannot be measured today, does that mean it can never be measured? Do you believe there are certain, f certain truths that will never be measured? In, in, in another way of asking this is, the way we define science as something that can be an experiment and statistically we can show sub something that is true or, or not. So for example, with the diet, a certain person could design a, a, a beautiful study and then he finds out, oh, there's this confound. Oh, I forgot to control for this. Oh, I, I can't believe it. But that doesn't have anything to do with science. That is the way the person is doing the science, right? So for example, you look at someone like Galileo or Einstein or Newton, right? They were all using science and math and, and experimental, experimental, uh, uh, tr they were training, they were training themselves to think in a way that someone else can replicate, right? So for example, if, um, and we'll get into family constellations and, and stuff, soon but imagine you felt something during breath work or you felt something during family constellation and whatever you felt is is can you can you fathom a world where that can never be measured because i know um Dr. Davidson, Richard Davidson at the University of Wisconsin, he's the one who studied the monks, right? So he would bring Buddhist monks from Nepal. He would sit them in an fMRI and, and they would meditate just like they would in Nepal in the, in the mountains. And what he found is that there were certain brain areas, like in the parietal cortex, which help us feel that our bodies are different from the world. Those areas were shut off during meditation and so he could measure and it'd be you know beautiful studies published in in, in peer-reviewed journals and top journals and and it's like okay so richard davidson is saying buddhist monks can attain a state of present moment and bliss and being free of the world and being free of ego and hey look at this thing in the brain the thing that separates us from the rest of the world that allows us to feel that our bodies are different from this laptop or this mic, those are shut off. And now these Buddhist monks are one. Or, you know, how you would have a, a, like a DMT experience or a mushrooms experience where we feel that, oh, there is no separation between me and, and the world. 
but that do you believe that there is something else there is an energy out there that can never be measured and if consciousness is not a meat then where is it yeah so many interesting things in there um uh let's see so where is consciousness and so what the the swamis would say and again this is more like second hand third hand knowledge based upon uh what i've read but then you know talking about what i've experienced myself first hand in meditation and experience first hand in family constellation is that we are actually in a connected consciousness so that the call it the body mind but the mortal the mortal the mortal body the mortal conscious mind as like the mortal aspect of ourselves the one that will pass is an antenna for consciousness um and the mind is actually bigger than the body but the body all of the body is in the mind meaning we experience everything through our mind but the mind is bigger than the body the analogy that's given is that you know we are a wave on an ocean of consciousness like we are an energy wave on the ocean of consciousness and this particular mortal body and brain is tuned frequency and married to that energy wave there's a marriage a divine marriage between this mortal conscious body mind and uh in that propagating energy wave of consciousness and i would say even the, the the concept of the father the son and the holy ghost is that there's an unconscious part of our minds that is semi immortal meaning it lasts many lifetimes it's not immortal but it lasts several lifetimes and um that's part of this trinity a marriage of trinities and then we've got our immortal soul but this is all you know for the sam harrises of the world this is all theoretical or hallucinatory or whatever that you can't convey in a as a concept i mean we can convey it as a concept as i'm attempting to with metaphor right now but it's something that everybody has to experience first hand and that's what all the ancient traditions were doing whether it be meditation um but it wasn't just meditation to calm the mind as in mindfulness it was to get to a state of what's called samadhi or direct experience of this connected consciousness which we can all get to um the sam harrises aren't necessarily aiming for that so they may never experience it it's like you only aim as high you only go as high as you aim right so you have to keep at it even more diligently but getting back to what you were talking about with einstein and the depth of knowledge that's possible with science it appears that we will never get to the bottom of the rabbit hole the rabbit hole will only continue to get deeper so we had isaac newton who came up with you know f equals ma right and so that was New- newtonian physics and that became like the foundation of the industrial Re- revolution right steam engines which led to combustion engines which led to the mechanization of uh you know making things and and then you know turning it into assembly lines and so on and so we're dealing still a lot with newtonian physics then einstein came to uh you know equals mc squared and suddenly space and time are warping and energy is 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 matter and matter is is energy and those two are related by the speed of light squared somehow right and so that science superseded the newtonian model again these are maps to the terrain newton had his map to the terrain 
which was, you know, good to a point. And then we got this uh, Einstein, you know, uh, map to the train, which is also only going to be good to a point. We still are experiencing reality, you know, in ways that haven't been explained. So, you know, are we going to be able to measure things more and more? You know, we got the Large Hadron Collider, you know, so we're measuring things at a deeper level than we have before. You know, we're no longer swinging, you know, pendulums and having them hit objects as, you know, F equals MA. We're now doing, you know, the Hadron Collider. And, uh, you know, and as scientists go deeper and physics really is kind of that fundamental questioning of the thoughts of God, you know, the Einstein, you know, I want to know the thoughts of God. It is asking about the material reality that we live in, but there's also an aspect that the mystics would talk about that consciousness and matter are two sides of the same coin. So what we're actually experiencing in matter is actually affected by consciousness. And we can see this obviously, um, well, you can see it in a number of experiments. Look at the research of Rupert Sheldrake um, and um, you know the morphogenetic field and so on. So science is starting to approach some of these things in a more complete way. It's not that the earlier ways are wrong, it's just they're incomplete models. And so we're just coming up with better and better maps as we, to the terrain, we're coming up with better and better maps as we uh, understand more and more and then test more and more and experiment more and more. But I would say, you know, at some point, our technology has gotten ahead of our consciousness where we're very much in the material and uh, we haven't, come back to recognize, which the ancients have recognized, that we are in a connected consciousness, that when we blow up a nuclear bomb, that that not only propagates in this physical reality, it's probably propagating in, in multiple realities in other spaces. So we're, we're, we're learning and, and we're like, I don't know, are humans the equivalent of teenagers in kind of the spiritual evolution at this point? But we're, we're definitely playing with a lot of uh, destructive things, kind of the, you know, you know, the teenager rebelliousness. We can we can experiment with all sorts of crazy shit and see what happens. Another thing, though, that you touched on that I want to go back to, which is where people get their insights because there are, and this is one of the things that I'm writing about, is uh, a concept that I read about initially from Napoleon Hill. Are you you're familiar with Think and Grow Rich? He talks about two types of imagination, synthetic imagination and creative imagination. And AI is mimicking synthetic imagination which is a lot of where our imagination comes from when we're in the in the thoughts of it right we're taking we're taking recording audio and distributing to the internet and putting it together and creating podcasting you know we're taking uh you know interviews yeah so you know podcasting is the synthetic imagination creation right um so a lot of what we create is synthetic, but the true genius of Einstein, Edison, Tesla, uh, Ramanujan, uh, Nakamatsu is what I call genius creativity, which is what um, you know uh, Napoleon Hill would call creative imagination. But genius creativity comes from going into deep meditative states, going into altered states of consciousness. Not just meditative states, but altered states of consciousness. And I'll, I'll tell you a couple examples. So Einstein uh, would go into a state of deep meditation. His favorite book in the world was Isis Unveiled, which is this book by Madame Blavatsky all about 
Eastern traditions of yoga and meditation. That was his favorite book. And uh, he would sit in his chair and meditate 10 hours a day, even shit on himself. Fly on a photon and see what would happen to space and time. Right? And if he had gotten up, you know, to go to the bathroom that flow would have ended and he may not have been able to get back to it. So he let it ride. Yeah. And um, yeah, in one year, he published four papers at the age of 25. He wrote four or he published four papers that changed the world forever. Any physicist would be happy to write one of those papers in a lifetime. And he published four in one year. And again, He didn't say that he was more special. He said that he was just more diligent. And by diligence, he meant sitting in the chair and meditating. And what you were saying about the parietal lobe, where monks are able to disconnect from what separates us from reality, that is part of meditation. De-identification from this body, from this particular self. Like, so if we identify all the time as the wave of the ocean, we don't ever understand the entirety of the ocean. So to get access to the entirety of the ocean, we have to de-identify from the wave. We have to remember as a wave that we are still the ocean. Right? It's not that the wave is separate up above the ocean. It's the wave is the ocean. It's just an energy propagation wave across the ocean. So we are the ocean. And to get access to what I call genius creativity or what maybe Indians might call the Akashic record or all knowledge past, present, and future, we have to de-identify from self, de-identify from this one, and just go to pure consciousness state. And there are a lot of different techniques to get there. And the ancient traditions offer those techniques to get there. But that's why the sages and the swamis go up into the mountains of the Himalayas above where all the thought forms are are, or why people meditate in the middle of the night. It's to get out of everybody else's thought forms and to be able just to be in a pure empty state and to ask questions and get answers. I call it the Google of the universe. And you go in and you have to have good questions. It's about the quality of the questions that you ask. And again, it's kind of back to the Socratic dialogue. It's like, what are the qualities of the questions that you will ask? And then what comes back as a transmission during that? And so maybe that's also what Socrates is talking about. I get a lot of really important thoughts in dialogue, right? And so just reading it isn't necessarily a dialogue. So we go back to Socrates for a moment. But different uh, geniuses get their insights different ways. You know, Thomas Edison would hold ball bearings in his hand. And as he fell asleep, his his hands would loosen, the ball bearings would drop, and he'd wake up with an insight. Now, Edison, I think he only got to like 10th grade. So he didn't really know math and physics. So he had to go back to the lab and have all of his people in the lab bumbling around for a thousand light bulbs to get the, the light bulb that burnt out in not too much time, but just enough time. It literally could have been like a perpetual light bulb, but no, he wanted one that would eventually burn out so he could sell another one. So um, it requires experimentation. Now you get to Tesla. Tesla was super competent in math and physics, like up, upside down and backwards. And so he could get his flash of insight, which apparently came to him in, I don't know whether it was quite an epileptic kind of seizure type thing, but it would be like these bolts of lightning in his mind anyway. And I believe his mother was also a meditator. So he knew to sit in in like state and then wait for the answers to come. But when the answers came, he could build the machine in his mind, test it out because he knew all the math and physics and see whether it would work or not. And if it didn't work, he would take it apart, put it together again until it worked. So he could do in two weeks what it would take Edison two years to do. 
because he knew math and physics. So obviously his evolution of technology was massive. Not to say that Edison didn't leverage having a lot of people in the lab and being able to experiment and obviously had the business acumen to build up enough capital to play around in the lab a lot and to have staff and all of that. Where Tesla like kind of didn't do his financial management very well. But, um, you know, he was coming from this heart place of like wanting to be of service to humanity and, and, and um, money didn't matter as much to him, but he didn't see it really as a fuel for creating more. But uh, that's that's Tesla. And then you get to somebody like Ramanujan. Ramanujan, for people who don't know, Ramanujan was a self-taught mathematician, poor, uh, economically in Indian. And um, he used to uh, meditate on mathematical questions, ask the question in meditation. And the answer would come back written on the wall in his mind's eye. And he would memorize the answer, come out of mem- come out of meditation, write it down, and it would answer 100-year-old mathematical problems. But he was this unknown mathematician, like literally like a bookkeeper at somebody's shop just to make some money, right? And um, so he didn't know how to get his insights out to the world. So he ended up and there's a great movie on this, uh, The Man Who Knew Infinity, if, if you can see it. So it's, um, they don't tell the story about the mind's eye, which you have to get from somewhere else. But um, so he wrote a letter to an English professor, Oxford or Cambridge or something. And um, this answer was so intriguing to the professor and his colleague that they're like, we got we to gotta meet this guy. So they convinced the university to pay for Ramanujan to be you know, sent over from India. I guess it's like the 1920s or something. Pretty racist England, right? And uh, and so he was he was kind of shunned. And, and anyway, he shows up, and the professor is 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 very respectful of him, and his colleagues are very respectful of him. Obviously, this answer looks really interesting. So they're like, this answer looks really interesting. It like came out of nowhere. Like, can you show us the proof? You know, like you started the agreed upon principles and step by step, you get to the proof. And it's like, proof, I don't have a proof. And they're like, wait a minute, how did you come up with this answer? He's like, in meditation. They're like, what is that? And he's like, it's kind of like dreaming. And they're like, oh my God, we've just like got the university to pay this guy to come over. And he's only got an idea that came to him in a dream. Oh my God. You know, so they're probably thinking they're screwed. So they're like, dude, you got to go back and you got to get back to the agreed upon principles. So I think, I don't know how long it took, but in the movie they depict it as like taking a while, but he's like maybe months or something. He goes back, I think through meditation, really back in meditation to the agreed upon principles. And he finds the agreed upon principles And step by step by step by step, it gets to his answer. He was right, getting the answer straight away in his meditation. And they're like, oh my God, like, you're, you know, so he probably, they get the paper published. And like, he's considered a mathematical genius solving this, you know, 100 year old mathematical problem now, right? That he got in a dream or lucid dreaming, essentially, or meditation, right? And uh, so, like, do you have any other any other insights, right? Is that enough? Like, it's like it's like Einstein. You just need one of those papers, right? So, do you have any other insights? And so he goes and reaches in his bag and he pulls out a notebook this thick. And it's like these guys start going. The professors start going through this book, and they're like, "Oh my god! Like, if even ten percent of this is correct, you've just changed mathematics forever." It's like, oh, really? He reaches into his bag and pulls out another notebook equally as thick. So they're using now uh, some of the formulas that were in Ramanujan's secret diaries to explain what they're seeing with black holes. So it's still relevant. All of this mathematics, infinite series and so on, 
are still relevant, like and continuing to be relevant today. And then, um, so he's a different example, right? Getting full blown answers in meditation, asking good questions, right? And then there's uh, Nakamatsu. So there's a there's a fun documentary. Uh, you kind of probably have to look around for it. I don't think it's on Netflix anymore, but it's the documentary is called Doctor Nakamatsu. They took off the the U at the end. It's just Doctor Nakamatsu. Anyway, it's Doctor Ma- Nakamatsu. And super interesting. He's, he's, I think he invented like aspects of the hard drive and the floppy disk among others, but he has three times the number of patents as Edison. And he uh, gets his insights at the bottom of a pool. So what he does is he swims to the bottom of the pool and he says he gets to within half a second of death. And that's when the insight comes to him. And if he were to swim to the surface and then write it down, he would forget. So he had to invent a way of writing underwater. So what's happening in all of these, as far as I can tell, is that they're all hacking the pineal gland and DMT. So supposedly, and again, I I don't know the specific science, so this is a story, and this is second, third hand knowledge, but compounded into a kind of coherent story, that the pineal gland drops DMT when you're born, you fall asleep, and you die. So most geniuses are hacking falling asleep. Meditation, lucid dreaming, it's when the brain drops between uh, alpha brain wave state and delta, it passes through theta. That's the lucid dreaming frequency. It also happens to be the Schumann frequency of the planet. So like, are we connecting literally to the frequency of the planet and the consciousness of the planet? Most people are up in beta. Beta is considered by Western doctors as a normal brain wave state, but it's not normal. It's an agitated brain state. If you read Stealing Fire, you know, they'll tell you this is an agitated brain state. That's where most people are at. And that's why doctors say it's a normal brain state. But it's not normal. Our normal brain state, our normal walking around conscious awake brain state is alpha. Alpha would be the brain wave state that we would be in as if we lived in a village. Our food and shelter were handled. Our family was around us. We had community and everything was fine. That would be alpha. Beta would be as if the neighboring village got wiped out, you know, their food supply got wiped out by a flood and they have no food for winter and they decide to either perish or come over and raid our, our neighborhood, right? Our village. And that's the brain, the the beta brainwave state is the one that's being attacked. Now, what are we watching on news? What are we watching in movies? Everything is violence, right? And there's an addiction, a dopamine addiction cycle on that, but it also is throwing us into an agitated brain state, which also throws us into fight, flight, or freeze. Fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. There are actually four. There may be more than that. But anyway, fight, flight are the typical ones that people talk about. But there's also freeze, and then there's fawn. And what happens in these states, um, that's what most people are in. Fawn is people-pleasing. Freeze is immobility. Flight is like, get out of here. That's a, a avoidant attachment style if you want to go to the attachment styles. And fight is like the anxious attachment style, you know, going in and like, so, so when, when we're in that state, we can't really think, we can't really have nuance in our thought. The amygdala is like all tensed up. And so it's like, you're either this or you're that, like you're either Democrat or Republican, you're either for the vaccine or you're against it. And there's no nuance in between where you can kind of say, wow, there's maybe 
differences of opinion. Maybe there's different science. Maybe some science shows that it's like this. Maybe some science is biased. Maybe we got to look at this with a more holistic view. Maybe we want to look at, you know, what's the long-term effect of this before we go around and demand that everybody get injected, you know, all of these kinds of things, right? You're either for it or you're against it. But that's the brain state that we're all thrown into in the typical day-to-day. The typical day-to-day has us, I got to get up, I got to go to work, I got to make a living because I got to pay my bills. By the way, when I drive in my car, I'm going at 60 miles an hour, which the body is not necessary, and the mind is not necessarily like evolved to move through space that quickly, knowing that this car could crash, kill somebody, and all of that. So we've got all of this working like, in, into the agitation, um, you know, and then there are economic crises and there are wars. And then there's like all the crazy news about all the violence in the world. We are in an agitated brain state when we consume all of that, you know, back again to kind of the mental diet, like what are we putting into this mind and what's that doing? Fortunately, you know, we were talking about Wim Hof, uh, earlier. It's like, um, there are breathing techniques, cheat codes. I call, you know, different breathing techniques are like cheat codes to this video game. But the different bre- uh, breathing techniques that can calm the mind, bring the mind back down into alpha, get the amygdala to relax. What actually gets the amygdala to relax is to actually go through a, a slight stressor moment, you know, build up with a lot of air, exhale down to zero go to kind of almost a near death experience at the at the bottom of the exhale in the Wim Hof and then deep inhale and the amygdala relaxes again right um, cold showers are like that it's like Whoa! and then you come out it's like oh my gosh I'm still alive you know the, but the amygdala relaxes again right so without the r- relax again afterwards the mind stays in this like everything's black or white there's no there's no nuance. So we have to learn how to bring ourselves out of that state. Popping up the stack back to the uh, to the genius creativity, Nakamatsu takes himself to to death, right? Where Einstein, Edison, uh, Tesla, Ramanujan are all kind of going to the lucid dreaming hack. Nakamatsu is going to a near death experience. Again, drop a DMT insight, write it down, come up. Right, he gets at the bottom of a pool, three times the number of patents as, as Edison, and some crazy things like water-powered cars and things like that. So we've got to um, be more diligent. What AI is mimicking is the the mortal conscious mind. AI is the synthetic imagination. You can go to an AI, and it can take this mass you know, neural net that's, you know, in terms of total number of neurons, I don't think they're quite at um, the human brain, right? But they'll get to the human brain size and then they'll move beyond it, right? And, And then that brain will become like this giant neural net, but it won't supplant the creative imagination until we figure out a way to do that, like some sort of antenna, for consciousness or something like that. Um, it will be very powerful, but obviously it's also going to depend on the data that we feed it. And um, just as we we know that, you know, if we feed people a lot of agitating thoughts, people are going to be agitated. If we feed AI a ton of bias, it's going to be biased. And that's why they're starting to create data sets that have been... By they, I mean the uh, the AI companies like Google and OpenAI and so forth. The research community are creating data sets that have already been curated towards things that are less biased, towards things that are considered uh, ethical. And um, but it's still information, right? It's still going to be written by somebody. It's still going to be synthetic imagination it's not going to come up with the einstein insight you know sitting in his chair 
flying on a photon to see what happens to space and time that still requires humans, right? So um, that's where we're evolving. We're evolving to these massive brain equivalents, but we've still got our genius creativity that we've got really where artistry comes from, insight comes from, you know, empathy. We can then feed that into an AI, but an AI is not going to, it could, has the potential to be really misappropriated and turned into something really heinous. That's what I'm sure like the Elon Musks are concerned about, but that's what all the AI ethicists are concerned about. Um, but there are, there are new AI uh, ways of training AI that self-reinforce the ethics, which are really interesting. Like this company, Anthropics, is coming up with ways to train AI with AI by asking the AI to look at their the AI's answer and test it against ethics, test it against, and so it becomes a self-reinforcing trainer. Long answer to... Science. Science is continuing to evolve. I believe that we will never get to the bottom of it, that we can continue to master it. But where we are evolving as spiritual beings, having this human experience, I think is more towards the understanding of the deeper reality that's always going to be ahead of science. That's why they say life imitates art, right? It's like science, I think it was uh, uh, Leonard Schlein wrote this book where he said that something like art precedes science by a hundred years. So what you can see in the art pre-Einstein would be things in the direction that led to Einstein's insights. So we are the artists. Obviously, AI is one of our creations one of our arts one one of the things that we've created and we continue to create but there are things that as we as we go deeper and, and again i'd like to make a distinction between spirituality and science i would say spirituality is just science that we haven't fully experimented down to a formula spirituality is more like an experience that we can each verify ourselves if we do the work, if we do the experiments and we're diligent enough, we can verify ourselves. We are the instrument. And that's part of our spiritual evolution is that we have to be the experimenter and the experiment, the, this being the, this body and this life being the, the experiment tool, the, 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 the vessel with which we experiment. Um, but yeah, trying things trying a different diet, seeing how it works, you know, trying Afro D, see how it works, right? It's like, wow, this really works for me. Okay, under what conditions could it work even better? Under what conditions is it not working as well? And so on. We all have to, if, if we all embrace life like that, I think we will, uh, and, and not just take the things that are given to us and do the things that we're told because, we should trust somebody, you know. Um, everything that I'm saying is at best, you know, who, for whoever is listening, at best it's secondhand knowledge. Everything that I say from my firsthand experience, you know, it's firsthand to me, but it's still secondhand to everybody else. Everybody else has got to either hear it from enough people or just trust enough that they have the faith that if they do the experiment long enough, they may see the result. And that's what I feel faith is. Faith isn't necessarily that, oh, there's a faith that there's a God there. Faith is that here are the practices. Here are the things that you can experiment with. Do the, have enough faith to, to do the experiment and see what happens. If Sam Harris had enough faith to go and do a bunch of family constellations like I have, do a year of family constellations three hours a week, maybe his worldview would change, right? If enough people go and do the experiments, they can change their minds because they can experience for themselves 
what people have been talking about as mystical or esoteric or spiritual experiences and, and, and experience it for themselves. But before that, it just sounds like a bunch of uh, either like new age cliche or, or a bunch of woo woo or whatever. I get it. You know, it sounds completely outside of the narrative uh, of the map that we've been given. And I'm saying there are just better maps. And the Western map is really partial. The Western map of medicine, the Western map of the totality of reality is very partial. And there are much better maps if we go to the East and we go to ancient, by East, I mean like ancient East. If we go to the ancient wisdom, these maps are really interesting. And if people experiment with these maps, they can find out some pretty pretty interesting things that go beyond, way beyond Western, Western thought. Very interesting, man. Uh, there's there's so much there. Uh, I want to go more into consciousness, lucid dreaming, and all that. But let's add another thing to this equation uh, that we're we we have this energy here, and so let's add Stoic philosophy to this now. So if you read Meditations uh, by Marcus Aurelius, I, I read it. I try to read it every birthday. So I started January twentieth, my birthday. I turned forty one. And now, uh, I think like a week ago, I finished it. I read it very slowly. I, I just, you know, read it a, a few pages a day. And one thing that stands out is, that he says is, whatever is temporary, you should disregard. Again, I'm paraphrasing, right? And he always says, do what is in your nature. Do what is natural. Something that is that will end one day. Don't think about it. Don't give your attention to it. And also, when, when we talked about the Ramanajan and uh, we talked about Tesla, we talked about we talked about Napoleon Hill, of course, and, and Edison, and the way you the way you looked at the outcome of the meditation was something material, right? Einstein's meditation produced the four papers, let's say. Or let's say that the, the meditation allowed for a certain consciousness, you know, the, the wave feeling the ocean, and now here are these four papers. But those four papers are still temporary. The world is temporary. The body is temporary, right? So when we go after how to get better at X, right? And there's also this concept of, can a person meditate just for that, right? It's like, why do we dance? Because dancing is amazing, right? Dancing is fun. Dancing is great. We don't, rarely have I heard a person say, oh, I dance because I want to X, Y, Z. It happens, right? Some people dance to lose weight or some people dance to like become more uh, sensual and body movement. But most people just dance because it's just a fun thing. So can we look at how do you reconcile a Marcus Aurelius Stoic philosopher and, 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 and like a Seneca and, and these guys, Epictetus, with the let me meditate on a question, right? Why? Who cares? about, you know, the Fermat's conjecture or, or whatever Ramanujan solved? Like, who cares? Always a good question. Like, why are we here? You know, and I think the answer for each person is going to be different. And when you talk about, you know, Marcus Aurelius uh, saying, hey, um, you know, be true to your nature. I think it's up to each of us to be true to our nature and understand, or at least get in tune with what, why we're here. And I can reflect on my experience and like tuning into those questions. And I think it's, again, it's individual. It is, um, I think we do have an internal kind of GPS, you know, guidance system to that 
that we have to, that we can tune into. And, um, and it changes the, 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 you know, the destination on the map, I think changes and there are different questions and things that intrigue us at different moments in life. And, um, you know, so, so to the stoic philosophy of, um, you know, only do, let's say, what's important or only do what's permanent and not temporary. I think that's a very, I think that's an important kind of optimism uh, perspective. If you, um, if you ever study Martin Seligman, he wrote a book called Learned Optimism. And basically he makes a distinction between how we experience positive and negative events and positive events if we if we experience positive events as permanent and pervasive meaning um you know i wrote this book because i'm a, a person who can like be diligent and and um persist and uh, work through challenges and all of that those are the permanent aspects of me right and then uh, being diligent is also, you know, a pervasive aspect of me. I'm I'm diligent in multiple aspects of my life, not just in writing. So when one frames, and maybe this is partly what Marcus Aurelius is talking about, when one frames one's life around those things that are permanent and less about the temporary, one disregards the mistakes, you know, so... Uh, in, in Martin Seligman, he says, look at positive events as permanent and pervasive. Look at negative events as temporary and isolated. Right. So if you want to be massively optimistic, that's what you do. So what does temporary and isolated mean? Does that mean I should just like make a bunch of mistakes and not care about them? No, you can look at them as temporary. Oh, I made a mistake. I can do better next time. And isolated. Oh, I forgot to, you know, do such and such, you know, in a particular domain of expertise in my life, right? So it's a way of framing the experiences. It's a way of talking about and thinking about, again, back to the story, this whole thing of, uh, it's all about the story that we tell. So he's, he's giving, the, the Stoic philosophy is giving principles around how to frame experiences in life to persist through challenges because life is going to give you stuff that's like challenging. It's like that Buddhist story, um, you know, could be fortunate, could be unfortunate. I don't know. Let's find out, you know, when, when the horse runs away from the family farm, you know, uh, the wife is like, Oh no, we've lost the horse. How are we going to till the field? And the husband's like, ah, it could be fortunate, could be unfortunate. I don't know. Let's find out. And the next day, the horse that ran away brings back, uh, you know, five other wild horses that were roaming around. And now they have six horses, you know, could be fortunate, could be unfortunate. I don't know. Let's find out. Right. So we if we frame things with that in mind, like we're it's also a Taoist philosophy that we're going to go with the flow of what's happening instead of resisting it that uh, we'll be a lot better off, right? We're not going to be, oh, man, I'm so stupid. I didn't lock the barn door, you know, and then beating myself up. And then that becomes the way I think about myself all the time. And then everything is horrible. And, you know, so stoicism is like, you didn't lock the barn door. All right, well, you know, there are other horses. And then, you know, if the so weaving all those little stories together. But um, yeah, so I would say Marcus Aurelius is, uh, is talking about how to frame things. And then in terms of um, something else that you brought up in terms of, um, you know, how to conduct one's life and how to know from one's nature what is important. How do we do that? And, you know, I remember being a teenager and like, I want to create businesses, you know, I'm into software. I know software is going to be really powerful. Uh, I want to create businesses that help change the world and improve the world. Okay. So that's like my direction at that moment. 
And then, you know, um, I get into, you know, I learned something new along the way and it's like, okay, I still have that commitment at the core, but I now have this greater understanding about how to do that or, okay, I bring products into the world and I'm going to change people's behaviors. So it's not about the computer programming anymore. It's about the interface, right? So if I'm creating experiences and getting people to change their behavior, I have to become an expert at how to create experiences. So I became an experience designer, not just a programmer, right? So that had me, you know, continued on the navigational path. And then, you know, through the years, um, you know, I went to, uh, on my, my sexual journey, I was very frustrated as a teenager, over-intellectualizing everything, my mother was a feminist, so I didn't want to cross women's boundaries and touch them when they didn't want to be touched. But I was in this conflict of like wanting to have intimate relationships, but then not wanting to overstep somebody's boundaries and not really knowing how to approach that. So then I found a sex therapist and the sex therapist laid it out for me. It's like, oh, you know, you start with just touching the arm and then from the arm, you know, if, if they're touching you back, you know, you go, you know, touch a little bit more and it becomes a dialogue through bodies. And you don't have to be in this, like, can I touch you? You know, it doesn't have to be like that. But nobody ever showed that to me. I didn't ever get that in school or watching a movie. Like, oh, you just start by touching, like, you know, uh, you know, non-sexually, and, the, and then if they touch back, like, it's it's a dialogue. So I realized in that sex therapist experience that not only could I learn that, but I could learn anything if I find the right teacher. So that became another, you know, a dot in the pointillism of my life in terms of figuring out what is this picture of my life. And, you know, so as time goes on and, and so on, then I get to a place where, like, I really want to, I started having meditative experiences and, and I really wanted to integrate what I was hearing about Tantra with uh, what I was getting from meditation. And how do you do that, right? So that became, again, it, I, I call it the GPS, but it's kind of the navigation system of one's own curiosity and desire and the way i ask or the way i suggest people to to uh, look at their own gps is to tune into what gives you the most energy tune into where you you get the most energy from things that you're doing like doing this podcast gives me a lot of energy do more podcasts right uh you know speaking about these ideas gives me energy speak about these things more, write about them, put them out there into the world, right? So, uh, you know, around sexuality, it became, I get so much energy from what I'm learning in my own healing journey around sexuality. And I get so much energy from um, meditation. I get so much energy from these uh, transmutation techniques and sexual alchemy what if I teach that to people? If I've gotten them, if I've gotten the idea that I can really transmit these ideas to people, what if I did that? And then, well, shoot. And then I've also got this background in building scalable technology businesses. And I've got this other background in designing experiences. And then I bring together this background around sexuality. I create a business that is around sexuality that takes people on journeys similar to the journey that I went on you know, but individualized and customized with artificial intelligence to help recommend the next best thing for somebody to learn or to experience, that becomes a hugely scalable, you know, uh, uh, kind of world-changing experience. Plus, it happens to kick off a lot of cash and, and make people who are delivering the lessons on the platform a surprising amount of of wealth so it becomes a platform not only for helping people heal but it becomes a platform 
for educators and for therapists and for for healers and for performers who want to show what eroticism can really look like in a really ethical way instead of what everybody's been experiencing with porn. So it becomes this whole thing that becomes like, okay, this is a lot of like, this is like hitting on all of my energies. I'm going to drop everything and focus on this. So that's what I did. But it's kind of one of those things where you got to follow along the breadcrumbs of like what gives you the most energy. And, and you've done this, but that would be my recommendation to people. And, and back to Marcus Aurelius, how does one know what one's true nature is? Because we've been told so many things about the way that we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to be. Our parents want us to be doctors or lawyers, maybe not even for our benefit, but just so that they can rest knowing that we'll always have a job. Were we even told to be doctors and lawyers because they thought the world needed a, a, a new doctor and a new lawyer? Or did they just want us to make sure that we would be fed and our lives would be okay and those jobs would never go out of style, right? I'm pretty sure it was like they wanted to rest or in, and be calm. And it was that. And, and, you know, it comes from a place of heart, but it's not necessarily what each of us is um, most called to. So I think everybody's really got to go through their own journey to tune into that. And I think Marcus Aurelius is probably saying the same thing. Like everybody really needs to tune into what is their true nature and what we've been given as what our good ways of being serves one person or another, but is it really serving us? And I would also say, if somebody doesn't believe that they can make a living following their nature, I am pretty sure everybody can make a living following their nature with, you know, some decent strategy and, and ways of implementing it. Um, but uh, to not go for what one really has passion about just because it cranks out money. I think that works for people who just want to crank out money. Let that be those people. But for everybody else who's more, you know, wanting to follow their passion, follow your passion. Mm. Uh, the guy who is our podcast manager, Kyle, yeah. uh, lives in the Philippines. Just yesterday, he wrote me a Slack message. And he's like, Doc, uh, I would love for you to make a video about purpose. Because, uh, you know, he watches all the videos, he does all the, the you know, the, the scheduling and writes the instructions and everything. So his thought process was, how does he know if what he's doing is something that he, he must do or he actually wants to do? Because a lot of people, and this is me included, uh, maybe not the podcast, because the podcast for me I've always seen it a natural thing to talk to people. Right? It's been always very natural. And, and the, this is one of the things that is most, most sort of like in my blood, you could say. But then other things, like when I did my PhD, you know, I was doing monkey experiments and, 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 and writing programs. And when I did my computer science degree, I was doing a lot of programming. So it's like, this is, I loved doing it. Like I felt really good. But then afterwards, I realized that that was just a piece of the puzzle, right? Just like you, right? It's like a piece of the puzzle, a stepping stone towards something other, something perhaps bigger, something more union, right? With my nature. But then 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if I would have said, oh, you know what? I'm just going to start talking to people like this. I probably wouldn't have done it. Even if the idea emerged, I wouldn't have done it because it's not practical. It is not marketable. Although you look at someone like Joe Rogan who did it and he's the number one podcaster in the world, right? And he just did it to talk to his friends and everyone thought it was, a, it was like an idiotic thing to do. And what are you doing? You want to talk to me and publish it? Like, who's going to listen to this thing? So Joe Rogan, guys like Joe Rogan have proved this wrong, that, hey, 
you can do something that you love. But then you also have to see that Joe had, you know, he had his uh, his his comic, his stand up comedy career that he, he he was making money from, his UFC commentary, also a UFC fighter, right? So he had certain levels of income to support himself. And I know a guy, if, if you ask uh, someone like Nassim Talib, right, who's, who's very much into tinkering and, you know, the, the, the Edison type mind that, hey, forget about becoming an expert in something and, oh, look, I'm an expert. Look at this. You know, I can teach birds how to fly with these equations. He's of the philosophy that just try stuff, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. And you're going you're gonna to find something which is more practical for human evolution, for, for the evolution of thinking, the evolution of ideas, than, oh, let me sit and study something for 10 years and do nothing with it, right? So someone like Kyle, who is very confused and anxious about, is what whatever a person is doing right now, if they can feel that this is my thing, then perhaps it's their thing. But if they are not 100% sure, maybe it's not their thing. Like wh what, what sort of baseline or, or, or questions someone can ask? Like Nassim Taleb always says, let's say you want to do something. Ask yourself a question. Why? If you can come up with more than one reason, don't do it. Because your mind is trying to convince you of something you don't want to do by giving you more reasons, right? So like dancing. I want to dance because I love it. I can't think of a second reason, really. I would have to really like flexibility, like meditation, like what? It, it, it's hard to think of a second reason. So... Is this one question one, one can ask? Like, hey, this thing I'm doing, why am I doing it? If the answer is, I want to make money, it'll be good for my CV, my parents are going to approve, then not do it? Or are there other questions to ask? And I want to know about your first-hand experience because you went, you know, you went to Berkeley, right? You, you did undergrad there and, and, and that was a different world. And, and, you know, when you said your mom was a feminist, I was like, okay, I get it. You know, <laughs> that it's like that crowd. Um, so, so it's like coming from, a, you know, living in California, traveling the world, you know, going here, we're in Mexico, in Tulum, you know, you went to Portugal recently, you were in Merida. And how do you take that firsthand experience? And some early 20s person sitting in front of you asks, hey, what is my purpose? What is my calling? How do I figure this out? Right? Yeah. I don't think there's, well, it's kind of like the mystery of the universe. We never necessarily know the totality of our life purpose until we're, we're doing it or while we're doing it. But to the Nasib uh, uh, point that, you know, yeah, we can come up with a lot of reasons. What I do is I check my reasons. Is it intuition? Is the answer dropping out of a place of heart? Is it coming from heart? Or is it coming from the ego? And so when I ask, the, is it coming from ego? ego? Ego to me is the stories that our mind tells that are trying to protect us and these stories can be you know uh if you're familiar with david hawkins you familiar so he wrote a book called power versus force and he calibrates consciousness and he says that there are different thought patterns that are either draining or kind of life enhancing and the ego seems to work a lot in the have a lot of the draining thoughts Right. The ego is the ego is the stories that the mind tells trying to say it is the one that exists. It is the Descartes. I think, therefore, I am right. It is the one that says whatever my thoughts are, that's who I am. And I think that's like 
maybe the Richard Dawkins, maybe the Sam Harris perspective is like thoughts are who we are, right? There's no consciousness beyond thoughts. I say who we really are is the awareness that exists between the thoughts. I say that when we choose our thoughts with our heart, instead of allowing the mind to make them up, that is who we really are. That is tuning into who we really are. If you want to call it soul, you could call it soul. But when we're really coming from a place of care, not only for ourselves and our family and our friends, but for all beings, then that is that is soul. That's where that's who we really are. That's our divine nature. That is the ocean talking, the ocean of consciousness. And um, when we think of our thoughts and, and we listen to the narrator of our thoughts, it's kind of back to that stoicism of. Um, thinking of what, 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 is, what is the character of the narrator of my mind? And if the character of the narrator is, you're not good enough, you need to do this in order to make a living, uh, you need to do this in order to satisfy your parents, you need to do this for you know all the shoulds, you should do this, you should do that. That's all the shame, fear, guilt, apathy, anger, pride, craving, desire that you know David Hawkins would talk about is kind of the draining energies. And those are pretty much going to drain us, right? I call those the Lilliputian bad thoughts. Like we are, you know, in the story of Gulliver, Gulliver's Travels, you know, he, he wakes up on the shore and he finds that he's being held down by all these Lilliputians. And I realize the metaphor there is that the Lilliputians are Gulliver's own bad thoughts. So we're all being held down by lots of little bad thoughts. Any single bad thought is not going to be strong enough to hold us down. So it's this collection of bad thoughts. And again, we're being inundated with all of these messages from media, from advertising. Oh, you need to be beautiful. You need to look like this, you know, magazine cover model, or you need to be super buff like this guy on the front of muscle and fitness. And oh, by the way, you need to buy these products in order to do that. And oh, by the way, you need to do all these things and have all these surgeries and, and you need to be, um, you know, everybody's selling something because they're living in fear because they want to have enough cash in their pocket to go and buy food and pay the bills. And, you know, everybody's been brought up in that. So I'm not faulting people for being in business. I'm not faulting people for, for wanting to make money. Uh, it is energy when we think about it. It's just the flow of energy between people, a liquid a form of energy. Um, but it is um, it is those thoughts that we have to be aware of. And, and, and when we meditate and we can kind of step back and observe the observer that we're being, right? And we can look back and I can say, ah, as the observer, I can observe my thoughts and I can say, ah, those thoughts started showing up when I was a teenager, when I was feeling really shut down and feeling like I didn't have a lot of possibilities and or, ah, that's the, that's the three-year-old, you know, who saw, you know, you know, his grandfather die in front of him or whatever, and he's reacting to that now, you know. So we have these different patterns. They're still in the mind. They're still in our mortal conscious mind. And until we reframe them or connect those into a more powerful interpretation, those energies still exist as you know, neurons and dendrites in our brain, in this mortal brain that we have, and they will continue to exert a force on our reactions to experiences. It is the lens through which we experience everything, right? Um, so by taking on the practices of, uh, you know, the Stoics and taking on these practices of like really being able to observe the observer as we write, you know, and we do our morning pages, what is the way that I've, you know, as the words come out on the page or as I speak the words into, you know, the voice recorder, what is the observer? How am I observing the world? I am, am I observing the world as, as 
you know, a contracted experience or am I seeing it as something that's expansive? So when I go to a 20 year old and I have a, uh, you know, 20, 22 year old going on 23 year old son, uh, 20 year old daughter, 18 year old son, seven year old son. When I, when I talk to, to my kids and then I, you know, extrapolate out to the world. Yeah. It's a journey We're we're not going to know. It's a, it's a world of mystery. We can look at, this is something that was taught to me when I was in my early 20s. It's like there are different ways of, of um, relating to what we don't know. We can say to ourselves, I don't know, and I don't like it. That word could be con- that word could be described as confusion. I don't lo- know and I don't like it. Like it's it's a frustration. Um, I could say uh, I don't know, and that would be described as perplexed. I just don't know. I'm perplexed. Or I could say I don't know and I like it, and that's wonder, right? So still, all three are, I don't know, but it's how we frame it. And so it's back to that perspective of how do we, what story do we create around experiences and around our own internal experience that enables us to either be adventurers in the world or be frightened to step out the front door. So when we can be observers of our own thoughts, when we can reframe experiences to be, you know, positive events are permanent and pervasive. Negative events are temporary and isolated. You know, by temporary and isolated, again, opportunities for learning. When we can uh, look at these situations where we don't know the answer and instead of getting frustrated and angry with ourselves or confused or perplexed, saying, I don't know, and I like it, like, what's going to give me the most energy? Like, which direction do I turn? Which gives me the most energy? So, so look at life like that. Look at life like, you know, to Kyle and to all the other 20 year olds and and anybody, wherever they are in life, to be honest, at any age, because I think this is a lifelong lesson, is at any age, yeah, to look at things with wonder as a child, Again, it's kind of that beginner's mindset. You know, it's like, um, I can't even claim to know a lot. I only know a bunch of, uh, a couple things firsthand, but in the totality of reality, I know very, very little, right? Because I've only experienced a little bit firsthand. So when we can be humble like that and acknowledge that we haven't really had firsthand experience with a lot, we can guess, we can hypothesize, we can obviously hear stories of what other people have said. But again, go for those teachers who have had firsthand experience and they're relating their firsthand experience. And then, you know, therefore it's like only secondhand experience to you. Take that, conduct your own experiments, go into the experiment with wonder. I don't know what's going to happen. Let's find out. Right. Um, I don't know. And I like it and uh, see what happens. And obviously with measure, with you know discernment, don't take on a bunch of experiments like jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. Hey, am I gonna be able to you know, withstand the fall? It's like, eh, you know, maybe not some experiments. So I'm not encouraging like, uh, you know, not to have some discernment, but go to your capacity. And uh, yeah, I had this discussion recently with my son, Max, and he was like, how do you know what your capacity is? And I'm like, well, you actually don't know until you've gone beyond it. And so you are going to injure yourself a little bit. You know, just don't, you know, make sure you've got some some reasonable safeguards so you don't injure yourself too much, right? So when I was, you know, in college, like this one time, I went running in the cold and the, the ground was frozen and undulating. And I, I said, I'm just going to run over this. Like, I don't care. Like, I'm just going to step on my 
toes and I'm going to run over and I, I did it and I'm like, oh, my ankles are killing me. It's like work through the pain, just work through the pain. It's just temporary pain. Just keep running. So I ran, I ran. I did the whole run and everything like that. And it's like, yeah, it felt good afterwards, so, you know, a little bit of pain. But, you know, the next morning I wake up and my ankles are like this, right? It's like, oh, okay, I went beyond my capacity. Like know what the, sig- start to learn what the signals are of what one's capacity is in different in different areas like you know if you're going to go and do stand-up comedy don't go do stand-up comedy in front of a thousand people right away go and do stand-up comedy in front of like 20 people to start off with you know that sort of thing so yeah know what your capacity is experiment have fun like there will be moments that are super intense life is like a cold shower it is going to be intense but if you go through it you come out, you know, you come out cleansed. There's this Rumi poem. I love Rumi. Do you love Rumi? Yes. <laughs> um, I'm going to paraphrase, which obviously doesn't do it justice. I, I'll probably need to go and memorize this poem. But essentially what he's saying in the poem is if you put your head in the fire, you come out the water. But if you put your head in the water, you come out the fire. And it's strangely reversed to what you would expect. But what he's saying is if you go into the intensity of the situation, you're going to come out cleansed. But if you keep trying to placate yourself and do what's comfortable, you're going to keep getting burned. So in life, we do have to go to our edge and do what is uncomfortable. In fact, that is by definition what has created our our capacity is we've tended to do what is comfortable. And if we keep doing what is comfortable, we're never going to move beyond the comfortable, right? If I dream of being a singer, if I don't go and, you know, sing a lot and, you know, wince at the sound of my own voice and do that uncomfortable practice and learn more and practice more and get coached and learn more and practice, I'm never going to be a singer. If I keep doing what's comfortable, I'm always going to be where I'm at. So that's what I find interesting about like the cold shower practice and and the ice bath practice. It's, It's like a very tangible reminder that life is like a cold shower and that it, if it doesn't kill us, it'll make us stronger, but we know it'll make us stronger. And, and that is true in life. And so Kyle and all the other folks who are trying to figure out what to do with their life, follow what you feel passionate about and go to that edge of your capacity. Learn from what you, you know, experiment at that edge of capacity. Take back what you've learned. You know, take those lessons and then turn that into the next experiment and turn those into the next experiment. And eventually you will persist. Diligence, you know, persistence, Willingness to be uncomfortable, willingness to experiment, knowing what gives you energy and how to follow that. I think those are essential skills that we all can foster within ourselves. It's like exercise. You know, if you look at people who don't exercise, they just want to be comfortable, right? Exercise, by definition, is uncomfortable. Like, I don't go running Okay, walking is exercise, but it's pretty comfortable. But some people don't even want to get out of the couch and would rather just watch TV and eat eat some chips. Hey, I love chips. I love TV. I could do that too, right? But if I want to be healthy and have a vibrant life and, and, you know, at the moment that I pass from this life, I want to know that I did everything that I could. I got to go to the edge over and over and over and over again. And, uh, you know, that's, um, that's the whole David Goggins thing. And that's the whole, you know, all of these guys are like, you got to just persist through all of this discomfort because, you know, that is, that is the shackles of our mind right there. Those are the shackles of our minds or all the things that we would like to be comfortable doing and feeling. And when we can persist through those, we're, we're, going to attain we can achieve greatness 
do but what about environment so Kyle is in the Philippines and we all know that set and setting are a big deal i mean we know this from the psychedelic our own psychedelic experiences psychedelic literature right psychedelic scientists and mentors this concept of environment and the fact that certain genes will turn on and off based on the environment we're in be it uh, an epigenetic environment for example and so if so let's do some practical examples someone who wants to become a tech entrepreneur is probably a good idea if they are either in silicon valley silicon beach austin new york uh maybe tel aviv right these there's there's places where you want to be if you want to be a tech entrepreneur now a, a kid who is growing up in the philippines or he's in a third a, a very poor third world country but he has these dreams yes he has youtube sure he has the mit open courseware right he he has khan, uh, the khan academy like he has all this stuff chat gpt sure but what what is your experience your first hand experience with environment because we we both know that there are different environments just in like country like mexico right there's places like merida there's places like tulum there's playa del carmen there's mexico city right? there's a lot of places oaxaca where you were in puerto escondido for a while so have can you be in a grounded state no matter where you are like can you feel like yourself regardless of where you are or is there something to be said about the environment turning you on in a certain way like today when we were in the balcony or close to the balcony you mentioned hey wow tulum oh my god tulum if i lived here there would be so many distractions and maybe maybe it would be hard to focus on on building your business and building your app and and your your platform so what role does environment play in your life and how important is it to move physically to an environment or it's not important and one can just regardless of where you are because in in the same book in meditations and and i think seneca is also a proponent of this this fact of hey don't be one of those people who is saying oh if i went to that place i would like the people or if i went to that place i would be able to make friends or i would be able to make more money where you are is where you need to be i think there's a lot to that i think there's a lot to that um we're born in a certain place in a certain time and under certain family conditions and i would say everything that we experience we experience for a reason and i would go to, so far as to say that um you know if somebody is in the philippines what they've ex- what they're experiencing in the philippines is exactly what they need to experience in order to have the insights that they need to have in order to create whatever their individual genius is and that there are definitely places that we can move in the world that have different energies and there is no reason to feel ashamed or feel less about oneself for having been born or grew up or had certain conditions that every experience that we have is somehow the medicine that our souls need in this particular experience in this particular life um i had a staff infection when i in my nose when i was 6 years old completely lost the ability to breathe through my nose well probably like 90% of the ability to breathe through my nose for a good 35 years of my life and um i was a mouth breather um and my second wife was like you got to get this fixed 
I eventually found a doctor who was able to do it because most doctors felt like this is undoable. But I found the guy who invented like 10, um, 10 different special instruments for, for uh, fixing breathing and fixing noses and, and was blessed with his surgery. And now I can not only breathe through my nose, but I have incredible control over my nose that I like the way the flow of air moves through my nose. I believe everybody probably has this if they can gain conscious control over it, but I can control which nostril breathes and, 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 and so on, which direction I think everybody has that when they gain that conscious control. But for some reason I needed to know what kind of consciousness was created and I had to have an experience of the consciousness that was created by a mouth breathing, from mouth breathing. And it was agitated. And it was, you know, a particular kind of consciousness. And I experienced that firsthand. It's not to say that some traumas aren't super traumatic, I mean, and terrible. Like some people experience war, some people experience incredible uh, pain and agony. And, and 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 so on, but if we can somehow embrace all of that and turn that back into a blessing, and realize that who we are is who we choose to be, um, maybe not physically, maybe not from where we grew up, but the mental space that we create in our mind is 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 our choice that we have control over and how we choose our thoughts words and actions that we choose moment to moment are are who we are or who our our highest self is that's why again i talk about coming from the heart moment to moment choosing the thoughts moment to moment being present between the thoughts that is who we really are. When we choose the thoughts, those are the thoughts that become thought forms that other people actually end up picking up on. Those are the thought forms that become deeper grooves within our own minds, right? Because the stories that we tell ourselves, if I keep repeating the stories that somebody else told me, saying I'm a terrible person, I'm bad and wrong, those become the stories of my mind. Those become the grooves of my mind. And then I, I start acting and living out of those stories. But if I start curating all of my thoughts, and instead of just like curating my thoughts, I choose my thoughts. What stories do I want to tell in my mind? And again, not the egoic thoughts, not the stories of like, I'm better than somebody else. Not the stories of like, I'm angry at this person for doing whatever, whatever. But if I'm able to really choose my thoughts from my heart, my own mind becomes that pattern and other people pick up on those thought patterns. So uh, this is all related to like what I learned from family constellations and us being actually in a connected consciousness. Again, Western model of, of, humanity would be where meat bags chemicals and plumbing this is a private idaho and um you know god may or may not exist but god is outside of us you know that's kind of the western model you know i got to go to the church or the you know synagogue or whatever and i've got to talk to god through the priest or the rabbi or you know um but i think the more complete model is that we're where these multiple bodies, physical body, energetic body, emotional, you know, mental, causal, and so on, etheric and all of that. These are all energies. We just because we can't see it doesn't mean that they don't exist. That we are not only in uh, three dimensions, like up, you know, uh, you know, up to the left and you know, across, but we're actually in String theory says 10 or 11 dimensions. The Kabbalah, you know, ancient knowledge says something like 10 dimensions. That um, time is actually 
another, again, dimension would be typical science, but that there may actually be multiple dimensions of time and that there may be uh, different ways of navigating all of this. And there's warped space, you know, relativity, you know. If you start going uh, through space differently, you can start going through time differently and things like that. So, but the, the structure of our minds has us believe in, in, in kind of our limited perceptions. If this is the electromagnetic spectrum, this is all that we're experiencing, right? What's happening out here, it's not that there's nothing happening. It's just that we're not perceiving it with our eyes. So, so what is happening outside of what we can perceive? And when we realize that we're also living in this connected consciousness and that we're picking up on each other's thoughts and that if I identify with the thoughts that show up in my mind, but they're actually coming from somebody else, how do I distinguish between my thoughts and somebody else's thoughts? And so this is kind of what I would say is, is at the front edge of science. I don't think we've really, I mean, we understand spooky action at a distance a little bit, but we don't understand how that intersects with consciousness exactly yet. So we're going to learn probably over the next years, maybe even within an, our short period of time, next five, 10 years, how consciousness interacts at the quantum level. Um, I think it's already been demonstrated again um, with the uh, research of Rupert Sheldrake that we are in a connected consciousness. We are scientifically, we are in a connected consciousness. We are transmitting thoughts to each other. I mean, again, Anybody who goes to family constellation enough can experience this themselves firsthand without somebody else telling them that this is actually what's happening. But we are in a connected consciousness and we are influencing each other with our thoughts. So we have to not only be conscious of our thoughts for ourselves, but our thoughts for other people too, right? And then so it's not just words and actions, it's thoughts, words, and actions. So when we're conscious of our thoughts, words, and actions we become much more powerful, I would say. And uh, so somebody growing up in, you know, a place is going to be picking up the thought forms in that particular place. And then the land has its own energy as well. Like here in Tulum, there's a reason why there's a temple built here, and it's some sort of energy vortex, some greater degree of energy or an energy whirlpool or something. I don't know exactly where all the temples are built. I think they're typically built on the intersections of two energy lines, right? And so if you look at ley lines, if somebody wants to read into ley lines and then look at where the pyramids are, I think they're always on ley lines, if not on intersections of ley lines. And so these are creating these energy waves and we're tapping into them again, the the uh, the theta brainwave state is the th is the uh, Schumann frequency of the planet. So we may be actually connecting to the consciousness of the planet or this connected consciousness in theta. And uh, where we are in that frequency, when we are in that frequency, we were able to ask questions. And by grace, we will get answers. It's not like. Google, you hit the return button, you get the answer. You have to sit there and basically interpret the answer, right? But it's back to something that you touched on earlier and something that I said about Tesla is the fact that he knew math and physics. He could interpret what comes back and be, be able to bring it into this world. So I'm not saying that we can just be, um, you know, speechless or, 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 or not have any tools. We need tools in this physical realm to bring back into this physical realm these insights, whether it be the ability to write, the ability to paint if I'm an artist, the ability of a musician to be able to play music or at least write it down, the ability of a physicist to know math and physics to be able to write it down. We have to develop those tools. Those are the tools that we develop in this world. And then we develop 
the we also can develop the ability to bring in answers to these questions that we feel are important. If I'm living in a world which I live in where I'm thinking there's way too much violence, I keep asking the questions, why is there so much violence? How do we how how could we possibly reduce the 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 violence on the earth? What have other people said? What do I what have I learned from firsthand experience? And then I come up with like, okay, gasm. Okay, if there are, if 70% of social ills are due to repressed sexual energy, according to Wilhelm Reich, if I can see that a lot of men have had their emotions damped down because they're all told that they have to go off to war, you know, if men are trained to not express and then women are like, why are, why are all my men like unable to express any emotion? It's because we've been trained from a very early age to be warriors right? If I have to go off and kill somebody else, I have to be kind of impervious to the emotion of like, I just took another person's life. And that can be very intense, right? So people learn to like repress that emotion. But what does that do to the, to the psyche? And what does that do to one's physiology when we repress emotions? And then, you know, one third of the men have had that, uh, one third of the men on the planet have had the tip of their penis chopped off. Right. And although that's not an episodic memory, you know, something that we're going to remember in our conscious mind, it's an emotional memory that we're going to remember in our unconscious mind. But if I'm a little tiny baby boy and I come into this world and like 10 days in, somebody snips the tip of my penis off, whoa, this world is intense. Like that is an underlying emotion that's going to be in my consciousness until I reframe it somehow and deal with it somehow, right? But the world is kind of frightening, you know? And, um, you know, one third of the women or more on the planet have had sexual abuse. And what does that do? And, uh, you know, when that happens in childhood, the protective mechanisms for that could be fractionated personalities, You know, oh, this is too intense that, you know, this relative who's supposed to be taking care of me is actually, you know, sexually abusing and then telling me not to tell anybody else or I'll be killed and those people will be killed. That fractions off uh, separate personalities that the waking personality of the adult can't even remember. And when it's extreme enough, those are considered multiple personalities. So then when men, you know, like women complain about men being, you know, unemotional and then men complain about women being drama queens. It's like, take a look at their psyche, though. One third of women have experienced sexual abuse. What does that do to somebody? Right. So somehow we have to embrace all of these traumas. We have to work into these traumas experience these traumas somehow as intense as it may be as medicine that we then have firsthand experience with that we can then maybe return to the world as some sort of gift because I couldn't breathe for 35 years. I can attest to the value of breathing through the nose firsthand, right? having had a bunch of experiences as a frustrated teenager, I can talk firsthand about what it's like to be a frustrated teenager and not know what to do with my sexual energy. So we have to somehow take these things. So whatever Kyle and whatever anybody else is who's looking at these situations and saying, but I'm growing up in this place that maybe isn't conducive. With the internet, we have access to so much but it's really so on, on the outer journey, on the ability to then implement what we learn. We have a lot of the tools like in front of us on our smartphones, on our computers um, to conduct those experiments, to be given enough guidance to conduct those experiences. But I would say the, the greater work that everybody has to do is on the inside and healing ourselves and accepting those aspects of ourselves 
that may have been traumatized. Because even though it seems like it's our greatest weakness, it can also become our greatest strength. And uh, doing that requires the ability to step back and observe, but also go into the fire of the intensity of those experiences again, fully accept them, and then we will come out cleansed in the water. Um, otherwise, yeah, if we keep going into the water, we're going to keep getting burned and we're going to be stuck at our whatever perceived limit is. One topic is family constellations. Now, I've the only family constellation I've ever done is with you, right? It was you, Fabi, and, and Audrey. And um, a lot, I think probably, I don't think anyone from my family or relatives would know what the hell this thing is. Um, or, or they would probably not know anyone who knows, right? This is some, something rare. And I'm, I'm happy I learned about it in Tulum. And you mentioned it several times already today. So for someone who knows nothing about family constellations, can you give us your firsthand experience with it? Now you are a facilitator of it, but at some point you were a student of it or you were a participant of it. And maybe still you are, because even as a facilitator, you are participating, right? You are one of us. So take us through that. What, what is a family constellation experience to you? And what have you observed in this process that is undeniable? Yeah, yeah. Family constellation um, is an ancient practice, uh, an ancient Zulu practice that um, when Bert Hellinger, who was the uh, German Jesuit priest and Jungian psychologist, went to South Africa to study uh, the Zulu or to convert him, I'm not sure which, um, he realized that they have no current life or past life traumas. And, you know, coming from Germany, that's probably a shock because like all the angst of, you know, the craziness that has happened, obviously, in, in Europe throughout the ages. And to see these people who are just fully alive, fully present, not laden down with a lot of, you know, angst was, was eye-opening to him. So he decided to... Um, stay and study and even reverse engineer what they're doing. But essentially he came up with this model. And again, it's back to this more, uh, what I'll call an uh, advanced model than the typical Western model. And it, it, it has us again, confirming this concept that we are in a connected consciousness. It's actually one of the bases of, my firsthand experience of being in a connected consciousness. And um, uh, Rupert Sheldrake also talks about this morphogenetic field, but we're all walking around creating a morphogenetic field, which if I were to look at you and I could see auras, I would see a, like I would see colors around you. Like if the energy around you translated into colors, I would see different colors around you. But to think that that was one energy would be uh, like a partial understanding of it. What it actually is, is a collection of a bunch of different energies that are in your consciousness. You know, for somebody, there's usually like some level of childhood traumas that are still in their energy system. Some level of family energies that are still in their energy system and maybe even some aspects of past life traumas that are still in the energy system. So if we were to pull apart those different energies and understand those different energies individually, we could take care of them. But looking at you in total, it just looks like a big ball. So when we look at... Um, you know, as Westerners, arrogant Westerners, if we look at, you know, what we would be considered primitive tribes, you know, dancing around a fire or something and doing some tribal thing, they're not, they're not primitive. They're actually way advanced, way more advanced than we are. 
And that's, that's the arrogance of our perspective from the West has been like, we are at the pinnacle of, you know, advancement. Like we're not even close to the pinnacle of advancement. So, so what the, the people who are closer to the earth without all the distractions and, and maybe without the uh, enzymes to digest DMT, they could go into a connected consciousness much better. And in that connected consciousness, we can tune. Now, the truth is, is we can still go into this connected consciousness. But again, because we've been told that our thoughts are our own and that consciousness emerges from this meat bag, there's no concept that I'm going to be able to tune into your, to your consciousness, right? But I have experienced countless times firsthand that we are tuning into each other's consciousness. We are picking up on each other's thoughts. We just don't know how to distinguish our thoughts from other people's thoughts. So we keep identifying with, oh, this is my thought. Oh, this is my thought. Oh, this is my thought when it's actually somebody else's. But when you go into a constellation, here's the process. So you go into a constellation typically with a number of other people. It can be as few as two, literally, or actually you can do it yourself. But let's say we're doing it with a group of people, you know, a good number would be like four or five people and one person is having a constellation. You could even do it with like 20 people and you would get even more insight into these different aspects and the interplays of energies between. And the the way that we do a constellation is basically we tune. So first we all agree, let's say that it's your constellation. Everybody agree that it's Farhan's constellation? Yes. Everybody says yes. Okay. Tune into Farhan. And then I could say, Farhan, um, again, if you have any particular issue, or is there any particular energy that you would like to bring into the room? Yeah, you may say, like, my grandfather. I'd like my grandfather in the room. I'd like to understand what the energy of my grandfather was. And um, so you may come over to me and say, would you represent my grandfather? Yes, I'll represent your grandfather. And you can put your hands on my shoulder and then place me in the room, anywhere in the room intuitively. So you could do that for for a number of, of people and then um, to represent, you know, whatever energies that are going on. Again, you may not know exactly what the question is. You can enter into a constellation blind like, I don't know what my issues are, but I'm not feeling fulfilled in my work or whatever. Or you could say, I really specifically want to work on my relationships. Right. And, and you could tune into that. And, and the people in the room literally don't have to think. Literally, it's tuning into what sensations are in the body and tuning into how one feels in relation to the other energies in the room. And what shows up could be described as magical. But I think there is ultimately a scientific explanation down to like, yes, we are in a connected consciousness. This is like we are antennas for consciousness. Not only is this body tuning into the consciousness that it's married to in terms of like the subconscious mind and the immortal soul, but it can also tune into the energies of other people's consciousness. So this is where empathy kind of goes to another level, you know, where empathy is like usually considered like body language. This is going to a level of you actually feel the other person in your body. And it goes to extreme levels of like where you can take this. But I'll I'll just touch on constellation at the moment. So in constellation, one of the first times I go into constellation, I'm super skeptical you know, I've had a couple meditative experiences that were like, whoa, what the swamis of India have been saying that I've been reading about in books is accurate. You know, in meditation, I got to states of what I would call extrasensory perception, where I started having bodily sensations that I've never had before. When I had a confirming thought, I would get electric charge all over my body. It's like, that's not a normal sensation. So I had these senses that 
you know, the Western model wasn't the totality of what's going on. There's way more going on. So I'm going to explore this thing called family constellation. So I show up and um, one of the first constellations, this woman is having uh, once a constellation. It's being facilitated by this, uh, this woman who became my teacher, Hazel. And she would have regular weekly gatherings and 20 ish people would show up. Two people would have constellations. Everybody else would be showing up for representing, learning about constellation. And everybody ultimately gets a, a bit of a healing, even if it's not their, their constellation. So this woman showed up and it was her constellation. She was trying to figure out whether to have surgery or not. We didn't know what kind of surgery wasn't going to go into it. She just wanted to know whether to have surgery or not. So uh, Hazel says, the facilitator says, all right, great. Why don't you choose somebody to represent you as if you've had surgery? So, okay. I'm like, in my own mind, I'm like, that's interesting. You can choose to represent somebody after having surgery. Okay. So she, the woman who's asking about surgery, she goes and says, would you represent me after surgery to another woman? The other woman says, yes. Puts her hands on her shoulders, moves her to the room, the center of the room. Then Hazel says, okay, great. Now choose somebody to re represent you after no surgery. I'm like, represent you after no surgery. And in my mind, I'm thinking this is role playing. Are they going to act this out? Like this is going to be a drama. Is somebody just, yeah, is this acting? What is this? By the way, to get to Family Constellation, I hadn't heard about it a week before, like two weeks before, but like a week before I heard it from a very good friend and a crazy experience that she had. Then I heard about it from somebody else within a matter of days. And then I was being invited to one. So within like a week of first hearing about it, I was in a constellation. So there's something to be said about this sort of like a synchronicity, something that you hear like a book people recommend to you all the time or hey, go watch this video or do this event or go to this city. You got to listen to that, hey? Again, it's like, I mean, the explanation I would give is it's, we're in a connected consciousness. So from the moment that I first heard about this experience that my friend had that was crazy, it's in my subconscious, even if you know other people don't know about it. And then suddenly somebody blurts it out because they can somehow recognize that it's in my com subconscious, but it pops up into their conscious mind. So I'll find myself saying stuff all the time. They're like, oh my God, I was just dealing with this thing the other day. You know, so it, it's something that we pick up on. And then we, instead of thinking about it or saying, oh, I'm not going to mention it, we mention it and it comes out and turns out to be something that they were working on. Right. And then I got it again, again, whoa, whoa, second time in my life. And then I'm being invited to one somehow. Right. So in this constellation, uh, the woman's trying to figure out whether to have surgery or not. She's chosen somebody to represent her after surgery. She chooses somebody to represent her after no surgery, goes and puts her hand, you know, and asks somebody to represent her after no surgery. Woman says yes. So she's got two people representing her, one after surgery, one after no surgery. Two minutes go by and Hazel's like, all right, just checking in what's going on in your body. She says to the woman who's uh, representing the woman after surgery, right? And the woman says, oh, I feel great. You know, I'm full of energy. I feel really good. Oh, okay, so the woman representing her after surgery feels great. How does the woman feel representing her after no surgery? She is doubled over the ground in pain. I'm like, is she really in pain? Is she faking it, right? But logically, we would be like, oh, okay, great. That's the answer to the constellation. Get the surgery, right? Again, I'm not fully aware of this whole connected consciousness at the time. So I'm like, you know, is she role playing? Like, what is this? But the woman who's having the constellation says, ah, I still don't know whether I should have surgery or not. Then this woman sitting next to me blurts out, 
I can tell you what's on her mind. I'm like, what? Seriously? Like somebody's a mind reader? Like I've been told my whole life ESP is not real. There's no such thing as ESP. You know, you can't read minds. Uh, you know, it's some parlor trick. So Hazel, the facilitator, is like, oh, I don't really want to know what's on her mind right now. I want to know what energy's in her field. Douglas, can you go and put your hand on this woman's back and just like, just be there. So I put my hand on this woman's back here. Later find out Bella is amazing, right? So anyway, I put my hand on Bella's back. And, um, and they continue with the constellation. Checking in with the people in the room. Who else is feeling energy in their body? Oh, I'm feeling tired or I'm feeling like my throat is like, like I can't speak. So on, all the way around and around for like 20 minutes trying to understand the energies in the room, right? And again, if you think about it as each person is tuning into a different part of this person's energy system, like again, if we're a ball of energy and we have all of these different aspects of energy in our system, different people become different resonators of those different energies, I consider like the subconscious kind of a resonator. So whatever is in the woman's who's having the constellation, whatever is resonating in her subconscious, somebody else has similar resonant energy and that resonates in the two people. And then, you know, it comes up into that person's body and mind, right? So again, it's like resonant energies tuning into each other. Again, we're tuning into frequencies. And we're all fractal reflections of each other in some way. So we have all of these, you know, different aspects that can tune into different aspects and different people. So people are picking up on different things. But still, no answer. Uh, the woman's like, I don't know whether I should have surgery or not, right? Suddenly, Bella next to me blurts out, I'm seeing a lot of oral sex. And we're all like, What? We haven't talked about sex at all. I'm thinking in my mind, we haven't talked about sex at all. It's totally out of the blue. And she's talking about what's on the woman's mind is a bunch of oral sex. And the woman says, the woman having the constellation says, that's exactly it. What? So apparently, the doctor who's supposed to give her the surgery made a pass at her, wanted to have sex with her, the patient. Now, the patient, uh, you know, when she was a teenager, she was raped. And so she didn't know how to say no. She didn't know how to say, you know, F off to the doctor. She didn't know how to fire the doctor. She had a little bit of power which was her attractiveness, right? So she's been wielding, ever since that trauma as a teenager, she's been wielding the little bit of power that she feels she has, which is her attractiveness, to, to you know try to get what she wants. But she doesn't really realize that she's being held back by this trauma that she's had as a teenager and fully expressing her no. So the facilitator, Hazel, says, you know, it becomes clear this is the issue. The issue isn't whether to have surgery or not. The issue is like how to deal with perpetrators and how to deal with those kinds of energies in her system. So Hazel asks me to, to play the perpetrator and for this woman to push back and say no. So she was like, no. And she would push me back. No. Push me back. No. Push me back. And at the end of it, she was able to say no. And she was able to say, yeah, she's going to go have the surgery, but not with that doctor. So the issue wasn't, again, about surgery at all. It was about this underlying issue. 
And there's no way Bella could have made that up. Like it came out of the freaking blue and it just like opened up the space of everything that was happening. She read her mind. Like, is it possible to read minds? I'm thinking. And then I felt this weird energy in my body being the perpetrator. I'm like, oh my God, like, how do I get rid of this energy? Like, I can't shake the energy. So I had to do a number of things with Hazel to really be able to let go of that energy. But that was a big journey for me along the road of family constellation was that we have to realize that we're picking up other people's energy all the time. So there's no formal invocation to a constellation. Yes, there was like, okay, we're going to do constellation for, for this woman. We all agree and so on. But in fact, we're actually walking around in constellation at all times. In fact, in relationship with our partners, with our family, we are not only acting out the narratives, we're acting out these, these, these subconscious energies that are stuck in our energetic system. And until we bring those to the surface and deal with them, just like she learned to like say no and back off to this perpetrator that was in her mind, she couldn't deal, right? And um, so we've all got to look at those aspects within us. So another, that was like one very early concrete example. Another really uh, powerful example was a very meek woman who came in and said she wanted a constellation, but, you know, we're sitting in a big circle of around 15 or 20 people again, and you can hear from here to there. Like, like she had, she was right next to Hazel and she would talk to Hazel and nobody could hear. And, and when she spoke to the room, you couldn't hear her. It's a very meek woman. And, um, so we get into the constellation and Bella, who had been sitting next to me in that first one, steps out into the middle of the room, points at the ground and says, look at what you've done, yelling at like somebody else across the room, right? Look at what you've done. Look at what you've done. We're like, wow, like that's a ton of energy. Like, where does that come from? I'm like, still early days. I don't understand what's going on in this thing, right? So she's pointing at the ground. What? Look at what you've done. So, so Hazel's uh, checking in, checking in with the person that she's pointing at. It's like, what, how do you feel in your body? And uh, the person there is like, I feel like a five-year-old. And I'm very frightened and frozen, frozen and frightened. Okay. And then again, you know, Bella's still standing in the middle of the room, pointing at the ground. Look at what you've done. And so Hazel says, somebody can, can somebody represent who she's pointing at or what she's pointing at on the ground? So somebody comes down and lays down on the ground at where Bella is pointing. And, you know, after a minute or two, Hazel's like, how do you feel? And the person says, I feel dead. And something clicks in the woman who's having the constellation. And she says, ah, the crazy person is her grandmother. The person on the ground is her father, and the five-year-old is her. When she was five years old, her dad was walking her across the street, and he got hit by a car and died. And the grandmother, for her entire life, blamed her for the death of the father. Because in their culture, like the, the oldest male takes care of the mother, and so this child from the age of five was like whoosh, shrunk down to like the most despicable person and for her whole life was like living out this meek existence that she had killed her father. At least, you know, that's what her grandmother projected at her. So she had to go through a whole process of back off, grandma, back off, you know. But how the hell does Bella step into the middle of the room and point at the ground and say, look at what you've done? Like, where the hell does that come from? 
right? Now, I would say every constellation I've been in, there have been deep, deep insights, not always as concrete as those two examples. So if you want the really hardcore concrete examples where there's no way somebody could have made that up, you have to go for a little while and you got to go with people also who are willing to let a lot of negative energy come in and just follow that intuition because Bella was able to do that. And that's what was intimidating for me at the beginning was like, if I take on this negative energy, am I going to be able to let it go at the end? And so we have these fears around like, ooh, that person's frightening or, oh, that person's scary. Like, I don't want to deal with that or I don't want to go in. But the thing is, you have to realize that you can always let go of that energy, which is really important whether you do constellations or not, because we're actually in constellations all the time and we're taking on other people's energies. So, yeah, there are things that I think everybody needs to learn in terms of how to deal with this, how to deal with the connected consciousness, how to deal with helping people with their draining energies, as well as not taking those on as our own, which, you know, mass hysteria becomes mass hysteria because a couple hysterical people and then other people pick up on that hysteria and it spreads like wildfire throughout our consciousness, right? So we have to be able to recognize these things and be able to let go of that energy. And there are a bunch of different ways of letting go of that energy. And um, yeah, many, many, many lessons at that level that came through during Family Constellation. And then some really, really powerful things that came through in Script Constellation, which is a whole nother level of it, which I can talk about. But it's it, it takes it to the next level. So script is when everything is written down and you play a character. I think you told me about this. Yeah, yeah. Last year. So, you know, I was doing all of this in, you know, L.A., which is, you know, the city of angels, Los Angeles, the angels. And it's interesting that the city of angels is the place where... Um, many images and stories for the world are created because um, what Rudolf Steiner says, are you familiar with Rudolf Steiner at all? No. He's the creator of uh, Waldorf schools and, and permaculture uh -huh. and very, very in tune uh, German in like the late 1890s. He was part of the theosophy, theosophy movement um, that uh, Madame Blavatsky started, you know, Helena Blavatsky. And um, he really tuned in. He was considered by some to be um, Adolf Hitler's like mortal en enemy because um, Steiner was in the early 20s warning people what uh, uh, Hitler and his kind of black church were doing in in the uh, spiritual realm because they were doing dark, dark things in the spiritual realm as early as the, as the twenties, early twenties. So um, anyway, so Rudolf Steiner said that um, dreams are where angels cast images on our mental mirror. So if you think about what happens in a movie is we are getting images and they go straight into our subconscious because we let go of our narrator of who we are and we emerge into the characters in the story when the story is made well. And we become the characters in the story. So we're being imprinted with these dreams globally. Because now LA, you know, is the producer of like the global, most of the global cinema or a lot of the global cinema, right? So it's so interesting that that is Los Angeles, the angels, angels casting images on our mental mirror. So I was in Los Angeles and pretty much in L.A. Every other person is either a writer, director or actor. Right. So my dear friend, uh, brother James, who is, uh, yeah, we're definitely like super uh, related in some some interesting deep ways, but he had written a script 
And he, I met him in Constellation. That's where I met most of my friends in L.A. because I was like, I'm never going to L.A. But then L.A. turned out to be really amazing when you're in the right crew of people. And so I was in L.A. And, um, and um, yeah, my friend is, a, is an actor, director, and writer. And so he wrote this script. And he was gifted somehow through the, the Constellation community, a script constellation. I'm like, James, what the hell is a script constellation? He's like, I have no idea. But would you come? And I'm like, sure, I'd love to check it out. By this point, I'm like deep in constellations, three hours every week at least, you know, and just like realizing how deep and true these things are and really starting to put together kind of this map that I've been talking about. And... Um, so it's a beautiful autumn night. I'm working at this company and the, the, the script constellation is like a mile away. I'm like, I'm going to walk there. I'm just going to walk, enjoy the autumn, warm autumn evening, the turning of the leaves. This was like through Beverly Hills or something like that, right? So I'm walking through Beverly Hills, beautiful night. I get there at this person's house and it's like 10 people are there. None of us have read the script. And then there's the facilitator and then my friend James. The facilitator read the script and my friend James wrote the script. And then 10 of us have no idea what this thing is about. And all we're given is the name of the character and the age. And before my friend James calls on me, because he calls on me first, he, he says, before he says anything, I just noticed my arms. My arms are feeling like lead. I'm like, why do my arms feel so heavy now? Weird. And then he comes over and he puts his hands on my shoulder. Okay, you're Mike. And like, whew, puts his hand on my shoulders and suddenly I'm like, noticing that I'm exhausted and my arms feel like lead and I just want to lay down. So my logical mind goes, oh, you're having a sugar crash. Like this is, this is a sugar crash. Like, did you eat something? What did you eat earlier? Like, is this like some carbohydrate thing? <laughs> right. And so I'm exhausted and I just want to lay down. So he places me in the room and then, um, and the facilitator says, okay, how do you feel in your body? And how do you feel in relation to the other characters in the room? So I say, well, my arms feel like lead. I'm exhausted. I just want to lay down. And uh, for some reason, I have a sense of responsibility for the people in the room. And that woman over there, I don't trust her. I feel like she's playing the field. I'm like, I have no idea where any of that came from, right? I had a logical explanation why my body felt the way that it did but feeling responsibility for the people in the room and that woman, I had no idea. But anyway, I just like, I just reported. So then um, like everybody, all the other characters report in, right? And then the facilitator says, all right, decide where you're going to end up and go halfway there. So I'm like, oh, I just want to lay down on that sofa over there. So I decide I'm going to go to the sofa but I only, you know, this step, I only go halfway there. So it's like act one, act two, act three, right? So um, I moved to the, the space, you know, halfway there. And the facilitator says, how do you feel in your body? And how do you feel in relation to the other characters in the room? And I say, well, I'm still exhausted. My arms still feel like lead and I just want to lay down. And then that woman over there who I didn't trust, now I'm sexually attracted to her. I'm like, where the hell did that come from, right? So then they check in with everybody else. And then he says, okay, go to where you want to end up. I end up on the sofa. He checks in with me and he says, so they checks in with me and the facilitator. I say, um, now I'm, I'm, I'm able to rest. Um, and that woman doesn't bother me anymore. I'm just okay with her. So it turns out 
And they do it with everybody else in the room. But it turns out everybody channeled the energies of the characters my friend wrote in a story and had in his mind. To the degree that it was uncanny, like crazily uncanny, to the degree that like 20 times throughout this script constellation, my friend looked over at the facilitator and was just like, what the? Like crazy. Like if this were the horizontal plot line that my friend wrote, he just got energetic insights into all of these characters that can add levels of nuance and realism to the script that just could not be understood before. And so my particular character, you know, was just waiting to die. Hence the, the, the drained energy that I felt like, where did that come from after a beautiful autumn night walk full of energy to come in and suddenly feel exhausted? Super strange, right? The responsibility that I felt for the people in the room, I was the father of like six of the characters. Where that came up in my mind or how that came up in my mind or why, why like where does that come from? And the woman who I didn't trust at first and then I was sexually attracted to was a girlfriend of my, my character's son. And James, who wrote the script, asks, like, he didn't ever imagine that in the script. He's like, how the hell did that happen? That woman who is representing that character said, oh, no, 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 no. That happened to her all the time when she was a teenager. She would go over to her boyfriend's house and the father would be like goo goo eyes on her. So it added this level of realism that he could drop into the story. But the bigger lesson in all of that for all of us, by the way, I ended up redoing, I'm kind of scientific, so I want to like confirm like what happens if I go to a second script constellation? What's going to happen then? I went to a second script constellation, different, different author, somebody I didn't even know crazy weird physical experience that made it feel like I was split down the middle. My left and right brain wouldn't talk to each other. Turned out I was a musician who had a really strong uh, business acumen as well. So like the right brain was separated from the left brain, but it showed up in my body. And again, crazy, crazy somehow the scripts that these people had in their minds showed up in the bodies of the people in the room. So the lesson for us all is it doesn't even have to be reality. You know, you go to a family constellation. It's reality that I had a trauma when I was six years old. It's reality that I had, you know, another trauma when I was three years old or whatever. All of these things are reality. It doesn't even need to be reality. You can write a script, repeat that over in your mind over and over and over again and it will show up in the bodies of the people in the room. So what I tell people is be really conscious of the script, of your script. Again, back to the very beginning of this podcast, the stories that you tell in your mind, like the whole idea of affirmations and all of that, repeating them over and over and over again, making that your story it's going to show up in the bodies of the people around you to the degree that you don't even know yet. Why was I so exhausted, right? This character, Mike, right? Like, how do we create these characters in our story? Like, maybe get specific with the stories, the characters that are going to show up in your life, right? Be really specific. What kind of energies do those people have? What kinds of energies, right? And it may be that people who show up in your life, maybe they didn't have that energy necessarily in their body until they met you. And you give them that energy. So be really conscious of the stories that you create in your mind 
even write them down and be really specific. You might as well make it the best freaking script that you can imagine. There's no need to make it like painful, <laughs> super painful, right? But you imagine all of the crazy thoughts that people have in their mind. Stories that they've been told, self-criticism about themselves, things that say that they're not good enough, people who who, who tell them they're <coughs> They're, they're not good, and then the person believes them, and then they, they start telling themselves the same thoughts, right? That becomes the groove of the mind. That becomes the energy around them. So be really conscious of those stories that you tell yourself. Write down the story of your life as if, as if it's happening right now, and those energies will show up in the bodies of the people around you. Douglas, one thing you got me thinking from this outstanding experience that you had, two of them, uh, and, and for sure many, many more, but the two you told us about, scripting your own story. So if we look at the other side of that, right? So uh, if you notice, I have a bunch of trauma books on my bookshelf, and, and the reason I got so interested into trauma is because most of my life, I wanted to not waste time with trauma. So whatever, yeah, okay, this happened to me, that happened to me, sure, but how can I use this trauma to make money? How can I use this trauma to become successful, to become famous, to sort of use the trauma as a gift, but in an ego way, egoistic way? So, for example, when uh, I had very low testosterone, my sort of mindset was, hey, the obstacle is the way. Oh, Marcus Aurelius. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my life all about how we can boost our testosterone naturally. And I'm going to use this trauma of health and, and you know, erectile dysfunction, uh, uh, anxiety with women. I'm going to use that sort of like take revenge on the trauma. So scripting our life in a way there, which we can be in the moment, be in the present moment and script a life which is beautiful versus look at the reality of our past. So looking at the reality of our past, would that, can you reconcile that with a beautiful script? Can you balance going back in history and feeling the trauma, but will you still be able to write a beautiful script? Or do you have to ignore the trauma, ignore the, 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 the stories of the past and train your mind to start over? Yeah, I feel like we... Um and maybe touched on a little bit earlier, but we have the option of making it our greatest gift or part of our greatest gift, right? Because here you are now, you know, having taken an ultra low testosterone or a low testosterone situation and turned it into something now that's helping thousands and tens of thousands of people. You had enough incentive or enough uh, self-preservation or call it ego to say, no, I'm going to figure this out for myself. And you're like, wait a second, this is something that most people don't have access to or know about, or now I can educate people on this and also let people know that this is happening worldwide. And, and now I can actually help people have better sex lives, better, you know, exercise better vitality in their body from all of this so the way i look at it is again it's back to reframing it's again the story that we tell around the trauma and uh there's actually this principle in acting um where the character every character has a fatal flaw in a story you know, this is a certain type of acting that was like get in touch with the fatal flaw of the particular character. And that character, they will either succumb to that fatal flaw 
or they will they will turn it into their greatest gift, right? So I believe that's what's happening in our life. So we we have you know again I had you know the inability to breathe. I could have stayed that way forever. I could have felt bad about myself and all of that. Or I can realize, oh my God, this is a gift of not only like having better breathing now, but this is a cheat code. Breathing turns out when you go into it, turns out to be a cheat code in a video game. If people are familiar with cheat codes in video games, this is this is a way of hacking our system and a way of overriding you know the the deterministic part of this game right so so when we realize the way i look at traumas is for some reason we needed to to know that or to experience that so that when we are going out and helping others because i feel like it always does come back to how do we help others with this gift? Like to really reframe a trauma. We could heal ourselves and just be done with it and kind of not think about it anymore. But I think taking it to the next level is to acknowledge the trauma and then to realize that we can empathize and understand people who are going through similar traumas. And then we can help other people with the same situation. I think that's turning... Uh, uh, the fatal flaw into the greatest gift. The gift isn't so much the gift to us. It's us turning around and giving the gift to others and helping others who have experienced the same things. So when I reframe it as something that I am doing, not just for myself, but something that I'm doing for everybody because I have you know, again, back to the GPS, the personal GPS. I feel like I have so much more energy giving to other people, like being in this podcast, sharing all of this. I have so much more energy giving to other people than if I just sat home alone and just acknowledged that my nose now works. Right. So, so it's an opportunity to see how these how these traumas can become our gifts. And that's, that's truly, and if, if we look at kind of another philosophy that I have is that um, it's kind of a Taoist philosophy. It's, it's that, you know, the universe is unfolding, unfolding magically. Like um, things aren't just by accident, like things are happening. And it's again, back to that, um, Buddha saying it could be fortunate, it could be unfortunate. I don't know. Let's find out. I think if we if we pause enough and come back into harmony with the universe, it turns out that every trauma is a blessing. That everything that happens, even though it seems super intense. And again, you know, I, I've come close to death. I've had family members die. I've had family members nearly die, you know, um, and I've experienced in deep meditation, like reality beyond this physical body. But again, to everybody who's listening, until somebody experiences that firsthand for themselves, it's going to be at best secondhand knowledge. At worst, it's going to sound like woo-woo spiritualism. But I'm willing to take that risk because there are enough sages around the world who have said it. I just happen to be listening to some of those sages and really trusting those sages. So I'm like, okay, let me try the experiment. Let me go and sit in a meditation retreat for days on end and see what happens. You know, until you sit in a meditation retreat, silent meditation retreat and intend to experience who you are directly, which is this, you know, introspection that Ramana Maharshi says, who am I? Who is the one that is experiencing this? And all sorts of thoughts will show up. Well, I'm a father, I'm an entrepreneur. And okay, but who's really experiencing this? Is it really the entrepreneur? Is it really the father? Is there an awareness? Like, and then there's the awareness. And then 
again, it's hard to describe. It's like describing, you know, what does red look like to somebody who's never seen anything, right? Not to say that anybody's better or worse having not or not seen it, but you, you do have to have faith. You do have to put in the practice. You do have to be, as Einstein says, you have to be diligent. You have to put in the effort. If you put in the effort, eventually you will be amazed, right? But again, all of the new age cliche makes it sound like cliche. So you do have to, at some level, take it on faith from other people and do the experiment for yourself and see if you can experience, with intention, go to experience who you are directly. And the reason why I say go to a meditation retreat is you got to boil off the mind first. The mind is constantly telling stories. It's a story-telling machine, right? It's telling a story about what just I just said. It's telling a story about you know what is about to happen, or it may be two years ago, a story about what happened two years ago. It's not what happened two years ago. It's a story about what happened two years ago, right? And it's not what's going to happen in the future. It's you know, the story about the future, right? But if we really want to, and I call it casting spells, and it sounds like magic, right? But back to the family constellation, you write your own script. That's like writing the spell that you want to cast into the world. And the more, I would say, the more it comes from here, not from here or here, not from ego. I point here at ego, but that's not really the ego. The ego is down here probably, right? Just survival, just trying to survive. Not to say that this energy is bad because this energy is actually super powerful. But work this energy up to here and then, you know, bring it up to here. Those thoughts then get transmitted. And that is how we cast spells. But because we're so distracted, we're so um, scattered, where most of us are in beta brainwave state, just agitated all the time, we can't form very strong thoughts and focused thoughts unless we do things repetitively over and over and over again. My friend wrote and edited that, edited that script for days and weeks and months on end that became very strong thought forms, right, in his consciousness. The other author wrote that script over and over again, edited it and refined it, became very strong thought forms in that person's mind, energy, right? That's when the energy, that's that's essentially how spells are cast, right? Over and over again, rep- repetition, put it into the mind, Now, it can obviously be taken into a negative direction, an egoic direction, but it's much lower energy in an egoic direction. If you you read uh, David Hawkins' Power Versus Force, you know all the draining energies are much weaker than the higher energies, right? Love, one person in the consciousness of love can counterbalance something like a million people living in shame, right? So I don't know whether it's considered logarithmic or exponential, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's not a linear line of energy, you know, between the, the draining energies and the, and, the, and the more positive energies. The more positive energies are courage, which is the crossover point, neutrality, I'm okay with life, willingness, which is, I'm going to do my job, you know, reason, which is what most scientists are at. Like I'll reason through this Then you get to love, then joy, then peace, and then enlightenment. And what the Taoists would say is that it's not that you have to work your way up the scale. Rather, it's that you are already enlightened. It's that you have these draining thoughts. So that's why they talk about do not doing in the Tao. Do not doing. It's like, like, what what does that mean? To me, it means do not thinking. Like if you're going to think, think, you know, from here. 
Don't think of all the stories that your mind can tell about everything. So, um, yeah, that's it's the Lilliputian bad thoughts that are holding us down, right? But we are already the giant. We are already that creator being that can manifest like that. But it's all these draining thoughts. I'm not there yet. I still have all these draining thoughts. Like it, these are patterns in the mind that have to be worked through. You've got to do it very dig- diligently. That's why, like, some of the biggest, uh, you know, the greatest sages, they went off into the middle of nowhere to do this work and meditation and, and so on to get away from everybody else's thoughts, to get away from all of the distractions. Back to Kyle, you know, to do meditation, you know, you, it is beneficial to have a place and a time of day to do meditation in silence. Best time of day probably is 4 a.m. when everybody's still asleep, right? Go to bed early. Go to bed at 10 o'clock. Wake up at 4. Do meditation for an hour. You will have a lot clearer meditation than if you woke up at 6 or even, you know, 7. So um, we are in a connected consciousness. You know, I believe it's the monks who sat up in the monasteries during the dark ages that kept the earth from truly descending into just like global dark age, right? Somebody is putting out like high energy thought forms into the thought sphere, right? But um, yeah, I, I believe that what's happening right now as, you know, consciousness, call it consciousness rising on the planet, you know, engasm is part of that to build this bigger snowball of like picking up more and more, more and more people in consciousness that it will only get bigger and bigger that, you know, more and more people are coming into this awareness of meditation into uh, heart open awareness into, you know, acceptance and compassion. I feel like this awareness around being in a connected consciousness is important to realize that we're not living in a private Idaho, that we're not meat bags I encourage everybody to seek out, yeah, family constellations, seek out um, some form of um, meditation practice, some form of retreat, because it takes a considerable amount of effort to get to no mind. And when you're in a state of no mind and you're then asking the question again it's about the quality of the questions who am i who is the one that is experiencing this there's a chance by grace that you will experience it and when you experience it it will be undeniable and you won't need somebody telling you anymore oh yeah we're in a connected consciousness we're an ocean and you know all of that you know concept it's an experience um but it takes it takes diligence All the, all the stuff we're talking about is something deep, something intense. And you talked about the two energies, the draining energy and sort of the uplifting or expansive energy. Do you see any, and, and, and very soon I want to I talk about how gasm plays a role in all this. Do you see how young people of today the youth who are going to be the future of the world and, and going to take us our humanity to, to whatever level we go. Do you see what energies are the most draining in the world today? And how can a person is, is a deep life, right? This is something, uh, you know, the Cal Newport, deep work, deep life. Because what you've accomplished, and what you've, you, you know, what your heart is is all about, is something deep. You know, I can feel it in you. We've spoken many, many times, and every time it's just a enlightening experience just talking to you. So, are there energies that you had been a part of which you let go? And what what were those energies, if any? And 
how were you able to let those go? Because like you said, we are already there. So whatever is holding us back, be it these dark energies or draining energies, I bet a lot of people have these energies. You know, I'll give you a simple example. In Afro D, we do ads, right? And we do Google ads, Facebook ads. And, and now I've taken a step back and I'm doing full t- full-time podcast, right? Because there's a level of marketing and selling, which is not my true nature. It just isn't, right? And it's regardless of the fact of how good I am at it or how good I could be at it. It's something that doesn't align. And be it maybe I'm a very innocent or, or, or I'm very uh, you know, drama queen, like sort of uh, a Cinderella type person, but whatever it is, I accept it fully. And I know yesterday uh, I told Imran, our, my, my business partner, I told him that, you know what? I'm not going to be in any more meetings. That's it, man. That's it. And I've sort of, this, this feeling of what is draining me is something you have to get to. Because usually what is draining you is also fulfilling you in a superficial way. Right? So I, t- I t- told a story. I wrote a blog uh, yesterday. I was at Digital Jungle. I just spent like four hours writing a blog, and it was about smartphones, addiction to smartphones. And I remember when I was addicted, I would treat the smartphone like my girlfriend, like my wife. I would literally have a pillow next to me in bed. I would put the phone next to me, and you know, I would kind of like pet it and go to sleep. And this was me. And that phone made me feel fulfilled like enlightened when I got that first iPhone 4 so many, you know, decade, decades ago, however long it was. And I still remember how good it felt to be, you know, third or fourth in line at the Apple store in Montreal to get that phone, waking up at 5 a.m. to get it. Now that I'm in a routine in life, right? waking up very early, doing the ice bath every day, working out at the gym every day, eating healthy, meditating, reading, feeling the energies of people who I speak to, I'm in a state where when I go in a meeting, I feel that drain. I can feel it, man. Like yesterday I was, I was talking to all my team members and I was giving all of them love. I was feeling their pain. You know, I was just like praying for all of them that they feel what I feel. And then I realized that this thing, whatever it is, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a meeting, it's not a company, it's not money or success, it's something else. Because I can feel it. And what I can feel is not any of these worldly, materialistic words, it's something like an energy. And this draining in the past Perhaps I felt it, but I wasn't aware of it, or I denied it, or I ignored it. So today in the world, what should people watch out for in terms of draining energy? And what should they take a step back and question that, hey, is this really me? Or is, does this thing have me in shackles? And now I'm just stuck believing in in what this is. <coughs> Thanks for that question, because I think that's, again, back to if, if we had been born Buddhas, we wouldn't have experienced what we need in order to convey to people guidance through it, right? Um, th- th- it's just not relatable for somebody who's born a Buddha, Right. Uh, I, not to say that there isn't the benefit to have something being born a Buddha, but w- it's our journey through the, the trials and tribulations that becomes our firsthand experience, our firsthand knowledge that you can make it through. 
So hats off to you for, you know, working through the traumas and asking these questions and creating this podcast so that you can bring on people who can help guide others through this, this crazy journey, this crazy adventure of life, right? Um, the energies that are, that are existing in society, you only need to turn on, you know, Netflix or um, the news or the mass media to see what some of the dominant uh, narratives are. And you can really break it down to narratives, right? And it's what narratives do you believe and what narratives are, in, are triggering in your subconscious, So the swamis will say like, okay, so you've got your mortal body, you've got your mortal conscious mind, which is controllable. You've got a much larger portion of your mind, which is subconscious, semi-immortal, and you can't control it. You can only know it. And then you've got your immortal soul. So the much larger portion of our mind, that is what I consider this like resonator, that, you know, we're picking up on each other and it's resonating up into our conscious mind. That is going to resonate up into our conscious mind as certain kinds of thoughts, right? And I would say in my subconscious, from from my review of my thoughts and things that trigger me, I have a fair amount of pride and a fair amount of guilt as far as draining energies in there. Right. They're almost two sides of the same coin. Pride over like being better than somebody and then guilt after maybe dominating over them or something like that. Right. But I notice in this lifetime, you know, for to go into my experience in in this life. Right. um, I notice that I can be very easily triggered into guilt. Somebody is relating something to me. Somehow I feel responsible for them, even though I don't need to be, and I feel guilty. Okay, so that's where I've identified that I've got a lot of guilt in my subconscious because I notice these narratives coming up into my thoughts. Somebody's relating something. Somehow I think it's my responsibility. And uh, they're just relating their experience. But I take it on as somehow I'm guilty of not doing something for them. I also have a fair amount of pride because I notice in my thoughts like, oh, I'm really slick on that or I'm really slick on that, right? And that gets me in trouble too, but in different ways. But I think that's, again, a protective mechanism. And there's probably a fair amount of pride in in my subconscious. So it, it behooves us all to kind of take stock of what shows up in the mortal conscious mind as reflections of what's in that unconscious mind, those draining energies, those Lilliputian bad thoughts. Again, we can't control them because they're impressions. They're what, uh, you know, uh, Indians call the samskaras, right? So these impressions are there of these experiences. Vast, it's vast, right? So they get resonated through current experience and then they show up in our conscious mind as a thought. So the, the, the regular practice is, and I say, you know, people ask me, so tell me your meditation practice. And I say, actually, life is a moment to moment meditation. Every moment, if we're present, then you know, we're meditating. So that's the trick, (laughs) the trick. That's, that's the intention is to be present moment to moment. Anytime that we go off into a thought, we're actually leaving this moment into whatever that thought is. If that thought is a story of the ego or a story of guilt or whatever, that's not in this moment. So again, it becomes this, opportunity to observe the observer right take a step back from one's thoughts and notice what this narrator is saying if this narrator you know i've identified you know what i call my belligerent teenager narrator you know that was the narrator who showed up when you know i 
really thought I was, you know, crack and smart coming up with these crazy ideas and putting them down. But then like, I didn't know how to relate to women. So I was like criticizing myself. And so it was belligerent. Right. And then I thought I knew a lot. So it was pride. And then also like, you know, also getting my pride handed to me. But that narrator has shown up a lot, you know, throughout the years until I really come into contact with it and really take care of that narrator. Because again, it's about reframing, just like we're reframing traumas somehow from, yes, that happened to me, to being, I can forgive those people who were involved, to be, how is this my medicine, to how do I turn this into my greatest gift? Um, we can turn these, we can take care of these narrators, these Lilliputians. Again, if you think about them as little people, there's still little aspects of you. It's not that you want to step on them and crush them. It's that you want to take care of them and, and let them know that they're okay now. That you're not going to like step on them and destroy them. So, you know, getting to know my belligerent teenager, acknowledging with my belligerent teenager that, you know, you're no longer hopeless with women, right? <laughs> you know, you do come up with some good ideas, but not, it's not about having the idea. It's about implementation, right? You can't be frustrated that somebody didn't recognize your genius. You have to implement it. You have to put it out into the world. You have to make something. And that's, that's its own intense process. It's like, uh, you know, you can, ideas are cheap, but, you know, you got to implement the thing, right? You know, it might have been a cool idea to have, like, Afro D as an idea, but it's a ton of work. It's a ton of work. And so people have to realize that. And, again, if we want to do everything that's comfortable, we'll just end up being consumers, right? We'll end up being sitting on the sofa and watching TV, right? You got to get out of the sofa. You got to go exercise. You got to go put yourself in uncomfortable situations. You don't know a lot. None of us really know much other than what we've experienced firsthand. So we've got to put ourselves in these uncomfortable situations. We've got to like face, put our heads in the fire, right? And acknowledge these uncomfortable thoughts of shame and fear and guilt and apathy and anger and pride and desire, right? So when I take a look at the narrator in my mind moment to moment, I'm like, hmm, who is that one? Like, which part of my, you know, story is that part of, or is it part of my unconscious resonating up somehow? And so then I'd look at it and it's like, what can I, what can I learn from this? Who do, which part of me has not been taken care of? Like all the shame and all the fear that I ever experienced, like whether it be shame that I wasn't good enough of a lover or if I had fear that uh, I didn't know how to relate to women or even get close to them or if it was, um, you know, the, the list of things that we could, you know, experience in those uh, levels of consciousness or the, the David Hawkins, you know, um, draining energies, you know, that those are going to be, they're going to show up in the narration, right? When you take a step back and you look at your story that your mind is telling, those narratives are in the mind showing up. Uh, it's like, oh, you didn't do that again. Oh, you suck at that. It's like, where are those coming from? Are those stories that other people told me and then I believed, right? Are those general hypnosis that, you know, the world has been telling me my entire life? You have to be super buff. You have to be, you know, you have to look a certain way. You have to do certain things. You have to buy certain products to be loved, you, you know, all of that. So I can relate what you're saying to with the advertising, the difference I think there is like a conscious form of advertising and then there's the manipulative form of advertising, the immature. There's like mature and immature. 
So the mature, you know, is one where you acknowledge, you know, what it possibly could do and, you know, have testimonials from people who've, who've done it and so on. The immature would be telling them, you know, you will, you know, tomorrow you will be instantaneously a better lover and like all of that stuff, right? So um, we all have to be aware of those traps and all of those kind of um, hypnotic suggestions that we have believed. And then it can also show up in relationships like, um, you know, advertising can be one form of like hypnosis. In relationship, we've learned another form of hypnosis, um, which is something we talk about with with Gasm in, in uh, some of our classes is that um, the style of communication that we've learned is considered is basically violent. So there's something called nonviolent communication. Violent communication is projecting our worldview onto somebody else. You're a horrible person, you know, generalizations about somebody based upon something or presuming their intention. You know, in relationships, um, it's easier to blame somebody else and say to them, oh, you're a horrible person or you do, you, do, you know, but to be, to speak in a nonviolent way, we would have to speak differently. And there are whole classes on nonviolent communication, but basically nonviolent communication is expressing one's point of view as as one felt in a situation, not projecting onto the other person some story. And so if I said, um, you know, in this particular situation, you, I felt this way, not you made me feel this way, but I felt this way, that would be the non-violent way of speaking about it. The other person can then replay back what they heard in that situation. And of course, then there's a greater depth of vulnerability there that's attained in that communication. And we can uh, just not only understand the other person, we can learn to speak without um, making the other person at fault. A lot of times our actions can be completely misinterpreted by another person based upon their life experience. Again, you know, we're at this table but we're having two totally different experiences. You may look at me and say, oh, he's arrogant and self-centered, but I'm just, you know, feeling like I need to talk a lot, <laughs> you know, or something like that, right? But it's not necessarily coming from one place or another, but we make these judgments about people. So nonviolent communication, we learn that. We need to learn that. We need to unlearn violent communication. We need to learn nonviolent communication. And um, when we can truly acknowledge that we're all having different experiences, that we're all, um, like our, our, each of our worlds is actually very different. Our inner world is actually very different. And, and, and we're basically strangers in each other's strange land like we, we can only do the best that we can then we need to really treat each other with a lot of compassion if we realize that if i'm having really crazy draining thoughts that's what everybody else is having having two of their own like we can kind of we can have compassion for people doing the crazy things that's why the genius of the jury system of a trial is like you know, a jury of 12 of your peers, like you want people who have had similar experience to judge whether you were doing something against the law or not. You don't want it, you know, somebody who's had a very different experience. So we do our best. We do our best in this, in this country. Um, but yeah, we're dealing with people of different levels of consciousness different number like different amount i feel like unless somebody's already enlightened everybody's dealing with some level of draining energy again if taoism says we're all already enlightened it's not that we don't have any draining energies it's just that if we let go of those draining energies we are we are already there 
Uh, the challenge is to recognize the draining energies. The challenge is once recognized the draining energies, the narrators to maybe go back to that younger aspect in ourself in this lifetime and give them the, the reframe, the nurturing, you know, let them know, okay, I'm, I now can, you know, meet women and feel comfortable and, you know, not feel like I'm stepping over their boundaries and all of that. Bring that younger part back, you know, up to speed so that narrator doesn't keep showing up as often. And slowly but slowly, that narrator will show up less and less and eventually not at all, right? And then as far as the subconscious energies, those are going to be showing up, you know, as thoughts. But also they show up in the conscious mind based upon the thoughts in this conscious mind. So again, the more that we cultivate the garden of our conscious mind, the less triggering the unconscious mind is going to be, right? And the more that we reframe the traumas in our early, earlier life, again, the less the unconscious mind is going to create triggers. It's also useful to, if somebody is traumatized, you see some of these warnings on movies now, it's like nudity, sexuality, cigarette smoking. Those are trigger warnings, right? So if somebody knows that they are triggered by nudity into, you know, either feeling offense or maybe, maybe they saw something that they didn't want to see when they were a child and that's a triggering experience, they can, they can either avoid the content or at least be prepared. But having a trigger plan can be very useful, you know, and if a partner uh, of yours has a trauma or if you've had a trauma and you know you still get triggered, communicating your trigger plan with your partner can be very valuable. So it's like, it could be something as simple as when I get triggered, I need to take three deep breaths and I need to close my eyes for like two minutes and just not talk. Because if you were to do that without communicating that to your partner, you'd just be like, <laughs> and your partner would be like, what's going on? <laughs> right? So it's a good idea to, yeah, have a trigger plan if you know that you get triggered. Uh, and then uh, follow that trigger plan and also communicate that trigger plan and then do the same with your partner if they have triggers. Because I think pretty much everybody has experienced traumas, like whether we'd like it or not, or if we think we're perfect parents or still something, something happened that was overwhelming to us as a child, too intense for us to handle in the moment. And it just like froze us in that moment. I don't, I, I haven't met a single person who hasn't had a trauma. You know, even people who I would consider mild traumas, they still had traumas. Not to say that there aren't some pretty intense traumas. I have to say that there are, not to diminish the the intensity of traumas, but um, yeah, they're they're in some way like when we can when we can persist through it and into it and fully experience it. Those traumas can be our medicine and our greatest gifts. So let's get into um, well f first. Lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming is a big topic. And the first time I heard about it is uh, there's a supplement called Hooperazine A. And it was a Tim Ferriss, uh, Joe Rogan, all these people mentioned it and some other bioha biohacking people. And it was like, oh, if you take Hooperazine A before you go to sleep, then you may enter a lucid like state. It helps with lucid dreaming, so on and so forth. I've heard a lot of techniques and um, and tips about how one can lucid dream. But then another part of me says, well, it's like just genetic. You know, you either lucid dream or you don't. And if you don't, then you're never going to do it. You're not in the 5% or 10%, 15%, whatever it is of lucid dreamers. So tell us about your lucid dreaming experience, especially like you had one just today when, when you were telling me in the morning. 
And uh, you also mentioned that sleeping on a hard surface, surface something that's uh, maybe a bit uncomfortable, helps with the lucid dream. Um, and 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 obviously you mentioned the you know the what um, yeah he was he was was it Edison Edison yeah he was and then he would so he was he was probably entering a state in his sleep, be it the lucid dream state or or and then he woke up and he was able to report what had just happened or he would have forgotten it. And this ha- they, they do this in sleep labs and, you know, the sleep clinics and stuff, these types of experiments. So, yeah, man, tell us, like, how can we lucid dream? I think I've lucid dreamt once in my life where I was on a roof of a building and uh, I was being dared to jump by someone. I think it was my brother. He was, like, daring me to jump. He jumped. I saw him jump. He was totally fine. And then I realized that I can jump because it's a dream and I won't die. But I still didn't do it. Interesting, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So much to share. Okay, so start at the top. I would say, um, yeah, there are a bunch of different techniques. But what we're really talking about is getting to this state of connected consciousness. Okay. So as I said, supposedly, and again, this is what's been handed down. We our pineal gland drops DMT when we're born, we fall asleep and we die. Okay. So lucid dreamers and meditators are hacking the falling asleep. So beta brainwave state, which most people are in, is this agitated brain state, 10 to 13 cycles a second. Alpha, which is our calm, like normal waking state, would be 8 to 10 cycles a second. Delta is like 3 to 7 cycles a second. And in between, delta and alpha is theta at like 7.8 cycles a second, which is the same as the Schumann frequency of the planet, right? So, so in this intermediate state, it's, it's neither fully asleep or in that calm state. But it's characterized by, and some people would call it astral travel, but it's characterized by de-identifying from the body. You know, either you could be looking down at the body out of having like an out of body experience. It's characterized from being de-identified from the body, but still being lucid. A big part of meditation and lucid dreaming is will. The power of will. You have to intend. And this is true in the world. Like we have not really cultivated our willpower, the power of will. Um, The power of will can be cultivated in a number of ways. I'll give you one really simple one, and it's horse stance. So, you know, you can share with your, your audience what horse stance is, but it's basically in a squat, uh, thighs horizontal to the ground for as long as you can. Aim for two minutes. When you can get up to two minutes, you're developing willpower. Okay. To get into the Shaolin Temple, you have to go for 30 minutes, apparently, or an hour, depending on the Shaolin Temple. So it's it's purely massive discomfort. And again, willpower to to go into it and to continue through it. So anything and everything that we do in life that we need to accomplish, we need to develop willpower. Lucid dreaming and meditation is one of them. One is the, you know, the, the power of will to like set out to do it, having that moment of resolution to do it. And then the other force of will is to persist in the practice of it. So um, if you think about what meditation is, and, and you know, Ramanujan was asked by the, the professors, like, what is meditation? Well, it's kind of like dreaming. Well, that's what it is. 
meditation is like mediating between the waking state and the unconscious in the in the dream state, right? And you're literally upright with your limbs not moving, de-identified from your body. Because if you start falling asleep, you'll start going like that. So you have to develop the willpower to remain present, even in that in the midst of that sitting motionless and not fall asleep. So to to meditate, you can drop into that state. And you know, a lot of people will say things like, Oh, you know, let me sleep on it. Like, you know, and then you'll have the answer in the morning. And that's what's happening. The ball bearings, what's happening is, you know, if you're holding the ball bearings when you're taking a nap, like Edison did, like he's basically, when you're going from alpha down into delta, you pass through theta. And that's where you'll have the insight. Most people forget it, right? But because he had ball bearings in his hand, it would clank and wake him up and he would still be present to whatever insight that he got. So that's the way the ball bearings work, is it's just waking him up before he forgets. So what is lucid dreaming? Lucid dreaming is just a different kind of being present, but while in the dream state. And part of that takes will. And so to lucid dream, you have to intend to be lucid and conscious while dreaming. And the way that you do that, as with anything in training the mind, is you repeat it over and over again. And it's just like, you know, building up a muscle. If you intend, before you go to sleep, to become, to be lucid and conscious while dreaming, you will eventually be lucid and conscious while dreaming. Again, it's an experiment. You have to have enough faith to do the experiment. But enough people telling you that it can be done and that it will happen you do it, right? And so, uh, you know, there's Sergio Magana, who's got his practices of Toltec wisdom. There's, you know, Carlos Castaneda. So Mexico, which is where we're at right now, is actually the, uh, it's the name Mexico apparently means the, the land of dreamers. So when I say Tulum, it's kind of like being in a dream. I mean, literally, it's kind of like some energy vortex of like half awake, half asleep. So I think that's what's, you know, part of the different energies of different lands, you know, some are going to be more intense and some are going to be more subdued, but there's different energies for the different places that were born. And I think there's probably different magic for every different place on the planet. So it's getting to know the magic of the place that you're at. And, um, but lucid dreaming for, you know, some of the practices would be, again, sitting on the edge of your bed before going to sleep and intending to be lucid and conscious while dreaming, while going through a particular uh, kind of essentially practice meditation that will then, you know, eventually manifest in the dream. So, for example, Sergio Magana will talk about um, different spirit different spirit animals that will show up in the dream. Some that symbolize healing, some that symbolize um, abundance and so on. So when you, you set a trigger that when you see the symbol that you want to address, let's say you want to address, um, you want to destroy the dream that, has you from attaining abundance. Like there's some subconscious aspect that is holding one back in, let's say, again, abundance, like holding us back from attaining abundance or creating abundance. Some, some draining energy, some um, unconscious thing that we, we're not aware of. We can intend to see that dream and we can intend to become lucid in that dream. And then we can intend to destroy that dream. And that will destroy the, the limiting belief 
that's holding us back from attaining that either abundance or health or what have you. So all of these traditions had different practices, but they all boil down to power of will, setting the intention beforehand and repeating that intention over and over again. When uh, in uh, dyad meditation, we would go in and ask the question, who am I? Who is the one that is experiencing it? this? It is with intention, meaning it is with will, that we intend to experience who we are directly, right? Without that intention, just repeating words without the power of will there, big difference. The power of will of somebody intending to heal somebody, having the power of will with intention and will to heal somebody has a huge effect on the person receiving me communicating this with the force of will, intending that my message be heard and understood, is, is the force of will, is the power of will, right? Um, and everybody has it, and it's how we decide to use it, and it's how we decide to cultivate it. But if somebody has a very weak will, they have to build it up step by step by step. And again, horse stance is a great way to like start experimenting with one's will. Go down into horse stance. Can you hold it for 30 seconds? It's very uncomfortable. Great. Now you made it to 30 seconds. Stay for 45 to, you know, the next day. Great. You made it to 45 seconds for a week. Now go to a minute for the next week and so on and so on. But keep doing it because what you're cultivating outside of the exercise is will. And that's the basis of everything in meditation and of lucid dreaming. Thank you for that. That's a, that's a perspective that I've never heard. I've always heard the hacks take this supplement or write something down before you go to sleep, like a draw an object that you want to see in your lucid dream to know it's a dream or imagine that object over and over before you go to sleep. It's sort of like hacking ways, but you're saying something pure, something intentional, something that is overarching. Okay. Build a will in life and that will allow you to be conscious during the dream. Exactly. And, and the, if you want to get down to the specific practices, and I'm not saying things like mugwort and these other herbs won't help. So what, what is lucid dreaming? So I was saying I was lucid dreaming this morning because I was on kind of an uncomfortable futon. And I'm not complaining. It was actually helpful because what lucid dreaming is, is basically wavering in and out of kind of that dream plus being conscious, right? So the fact that so a lot of um, uh, tools that you can buy, you know, take out willpower and just, okay, you have the willpower to buy the tool. <laughs> but, you know, these tools will try to trigger you out of the dream periodically, right? So having something slightly uncomfortable will trigger me out. Another thing that I've seen people do is lucid dream with somebody else, but somebody's holding a knife on your chest. So as you're like almost going off to sleep, but then you realize the knife is there. But then you kind of go to sleep, but then you realize the knife is there. So it's, again, this wavering in and out. Um, the, the writing something down ahead of time, again, is will, willpower, right? You're intending to experience lucid dreaming. Another one that's really powerful that the Swamis recommend is fairly hard. I still haven't gotten there is to lay down on your back. I personally can fall asleep very easily by laying on my back. But lay on your back and count from one to a thousand and then a thousand down to one. And when you can accomplish that, you've done something. Because to not fall asleep while counting to a thousand and back down again is you have to have will. You have to have strong will. Wow. But when you're able to do that, and so the definition actually of a yogi is not, you know, I can do a bunch of asanas. 
It's not, you know, oh, I can, um, you know, do the bow pose and, the, and, you know, whatever pose. The definition of a yogi is somebody who is conscious 24-7. That includes in deep sleep. So apparently in deep sleep, anything that you hear, you will remember perfectly as if it's a recording tape. So somebody could be speaking in another language. And if you are lucid in deep sleep, you will be able to say exactly what the person said back again after you come out of it. And they've done experiments with like swamis who are, have attained this level of control. But their instruction to get there, do the practice. Count to a thousand, laying on your back, you know, at night, count to a thousand, or even do it during the day if you can. Count to a thousand, count back down to zero again. When you've accomplished that, you've done something. Wow. Okay. Something to try out, man. That's really cool. Good, really good tip. Um, let's go to Gazim now. Really, uh, really fascinating. When I first met you in Digital Jungle, um, I saw that you were talking to investors and you know funding and raising money for the app. You showed me your prototype. Uh, and, and since that time, it's been a couple of years. It used to be, I think, gasm.tv. Now it's gasm.life, right? And so take us through this journey. What is the... How do you... What narrative do you want to see in the world? What narrative are you putting out in the world? What type of world do you want to see when it comes to sexual liberation? How do you want the kids who are growing up and the sex education that they are taught in schools, how, how do you see that happening so they are not repressed? How do you see parents talking to their children about sex? How do you see the 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 catholic church dealing with sex and and all the 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 rape and child molestation that happens how do you see people's even even those who are sexual deviants and are perhaps they're repressed and then they become criminals and they rape women you know serial rapers child molesters how do you see all that? What narrative would you love to have in the world? And how does Gasm contribute to that? Mm. Beautiful, thanks. Yeah, um, maybe it would help to start a little bit with where we're at and how we got here. And then really to go into kind of the vision. Um, so, so where we're at now, as you said, like, We've been working on this for, for several years. Um, this is what I equate to as like the production of a very thoughtful movie. Um, most movies, if you, if you look at like the makings of, of Pixar movies, it takes four years to make a Pixar movie. What's interesting is it takes about two years to write the script. And if you think about Pixar, it's not that they're not experimenting with 3D animation. It's that um, it's all about the script. And again, back to what we've been saying since the beginning of this podcast, it's all about the script, right? It's all about the narrative. It's all about the story that we create. And the vision has always been to um, help people on their um Sex, sex exploration journey, but at a deeper level on their spiritual journey. Um, as I have gone through my own, you know, sex education journey, having, you know, not known what to do as a teenager, not know how to really approach women in a consensual way or know how to do that in a way that wouldn't like feel like I was violating their boundaries, but then learning from a sex therapist my own personal trauma became kind of the seed of this, right? And then realizing through further experimentation that there was so much more to sexuality than just pleasure, that there was a degree of healing and um, 
expression and creativity that is in this energy. If you think about it, the entire universe is sex. Everything is creation, being created, right? Everything is that creative energy. And we can either repress it in ourselves and tell ourselves that it's shameful, that we should be in fear of it, that we're not good enough, you know, let's say in the bedroom, uh, that, you know, the tip of our penis has been chopped off with circumcision, therefore, you know, this is a scary world. Or, you know, we've experienced sexual abuse, this is a scary world. There's a lot of those energies in our system as we've been talking about family constellation and we've been talking about how to heal traumas. So GASM really is here to help people um, realize at a deep level how sexuality is intimately tied to our creativity, intimately tied to our power in the world, our ability to be who we really are, to be free of shame and fear and guilt, and to live more deeper and enriching lives. And to do that through exciting and fun sex and love relationships. Turns out sex and love are catalysts for our growth. You know, whether it be you know, a sexual relationship where we're learning about our own desires and learning about things that trigger us or a relationship where, you know, a certain person that we're with, we're triggering each other in a certain way, but it really is a deeper understanding of the traumas that we experienced as children and maybe the relationship that we saw between our parents and we're playing out again. And whether we continue forward ignoring that those patterns of behavior or we take care of those healings within us and then our children don't have them anymore so we're really talking about transforming the world or helping transform the world through sexual exploration and um yeah as i have personally firsthand experienced my partners have experienced firsthand as well the journey is powerful. Uh, at times, um, you know, just the revelations and the amount of energy that's on the other side of all of the fear and the guilt and shame is tremendous. You know, I, I talk about, you know, the Lilliputian bad thoughts. It's like a lot of that is around sexuality. A lot of that is around what our expectations are for being men or women in this world whether we're attractive or not, whether we're going to be attractive to a mate, whether we're going to be able to support ourselves, whether that's going to be attractive, whether we're, you know, all of these things end up a lot of it being related back to these original traumas around sex. And um, I would say Christianity as the underlying um the underlying nature of Christianity is incredibly beautiful and that the original teachings of Christ are beautiful, but they also were more holistic than what we've been handed. And so we need to be aware of that, that we're getting a, a fraction of what are the complete te teachings of Christ. And it's not, um, it's not, It's not too, that's the right word. We can understand why. And uh, I mean, churches ended up becoming basically businesses. And um, they end up, ended up becoming, you're either in this religion or you're not. And if you're in this religion, you're not in that religion. And so it just became like Apple versus Microsoft. You know, and the truth is, is that all the ancient traditions have incredible practices to get to these direct experiences of who we really are. 
but they've all been turned into a business in one shape or form. Um, probably Buddhism less than any others, but um, you know, most religion has been turned into a bunch of secondary and tertiary businesses, whether it be Christmas and Easter and Hallmark and, you know, the booze that you want to buy on, you know, eggnog on Christmas or whatever, right? It's just like it's, it's been turned into a business. And again, if we go back to the original teachings of Christ or the original teachings of, you know, uh, Judaism or, uh, you know, uh, Islam, they're all beautiful teachings. It's just that they've been separated and made into competing factions against one another. And um, any and all religions are just that. Like, I, I'm not trying to disparage religion, but I think what we're really all talking about is our deep connection to who we really are and getting there and how do we get there and what are the ways, what are the practices, again, having faith to getting there. Praying is one, you know, malas or, you know, uh, certain times of the day or, you know, meditation is another. It's all about putting in thoughts into the mind that we're trying to recondition the mind to be open to these experiences and setting those intentions and that willpower to experience who we really are. Um, when we're told that we have to pay somebody else to get there or that to talk to God, we need to pay somebody, that's when I would deviate from that. And I would say, no, no, it's within you. You are the ocean. You are the wave on the ocean. You can, you are the, you are the ocean as well as the wave, but to get there, it requires willpower to get there requires uh, the intention and the focus and, and the experiments and whichever experiments you want to do. So GASM provides a lot of experiences. So it's a, what we call an adult learn and play platform. So it's not just about kind of pedantic, you know, here's how men make men and women make babies, or here's how, you know, uh, gay couples have sex or anything like that. Um, it's about how to uh, get in deeper touch with yourself. So practices are including things like meditations, uh, breathing practices, um, writing practices, uh, again, getting more in touch with um, um, what is deeper within us, becoming more authentic with who we are, understanding our individual uh, uniqueness and being able to embrace our uniqueness instead of feeling like we need to conform. It will have the technical aspects that, you know, a sex education would have, but it would go way, it goes way beyond, um, you know, here's how you put a condom on a banana type of thing, or here's how, you know, the sperm fertilizes the egg. Most men really don't know their way around, you know, um, a woman's body. Um, I, I usually say, you know, men are like fire, women are like water, right? Men get excited very quickly, but women need to be brought up to a boil, right? But looking at porn, it's very mis misguiding. And you would think that, you know, the guy, the, the pool guy knocks on the door, the woman lets him in, and two minutes later, they're having sex, right? But that's not reality. It's fantasy, but unfortunately, something like 55% or more of guys are getting their sex education from porn. It's understandable because there's not really anything else out there. And it's not, it, what is out there is either hard to find or, or pedantic. And that's why we're a learn and play platform. So it's the learning aspect and the play aspect and the fun aspect. Right. So that play aspect can be, you know, sitting down with you and your partner and asking good questions of each other. Like, what's the most beautiful uh, place that you've ever made love? Like like a very beginning level, you know, that might be something like that. But something to step into these more intimate questions about one's own experience and being able to share that experience with one's partner and really receive 
the acceptance from somebody. So again, it loses the weight in the mind. Um, there's this principle in meditation. It's, it's called thoughts are incomplete communication. And when we're able to express our thoughts and they are fully received by an other, they lose the weight in the mind and they stop ricocheting around in there. So just like in nonviolent communication, when we can express our experience to another person and it's fully accepted, when we can relate our intimate experiences, you know, let's say, you know, what's happened earlier in our life or things that we thought should be secrets, when we're able to express them and have them fully received, especially from a partner who is, again, somebody who we're wanting to be close with, and they fully accept that because obviously they have their own traumas and they can fully accept that it loses the weight in our mind and we can be free of that ricocheting experience in our mind. So Gasm, the app, guides people through these experiences in fun and interesting ways. It teaches people about anatomy, yes. It teaches people about pleasure. It teaches people about how to last longer in bed, teaches people uh, about um, slowing down, teaches about um, experiencing deeper, more profound orgasms. All of these things on, on, on the learning side and then all of the fun on the play side where you're really learning to... The whole science of play is really interesting. Play from childhood is... Uh, kind of non-consequential experimentation, right? So in the playground, it's like, let's pretend to be, you know, airplanes and flying around, you know, whatever it is, go and do it. And that's what kids do. We lose that a lot because we, we come to think as adults that we have to be on it. We have to know our shit. We have to, you know, you know, when we show up in the bedroom, we have to know what we're doing and all of that kind of stuff. But whereas play is like, come on, let's have a good time. And if make mistakes happen, Gasm is a place to have those playful moments, either with a partner or with other people online and do it in a non-consequential way where like, if you want to play first before experiencing it with a partner in the bedroom, you can go to Gasm and do that. And it's a place that people can go instead of going to porn to like have a more enriching experience and know actually what they're seeing and experiencing is real is not fantasy. And um, yeah, it goes super deep because obviously like the first level is going to be, you know, um, the, our initial target audience is sexual explorers, novice sexual explorers. So these are people who have heard about sex parties or heard about Tantra, but it's too intimidating to go, right? So they just want somebody to guide them into being able to go do those things. Those are our early adopters. From there, we'll move into, we have over eight different kind of psychographics of, of people and, and kind of their situations in life. You could be people who are already in, uh, you know, parents and they're experiencing a dip in their um, intimate relations because of children being around. It could be people in their mature ages because things happen biologically and all sorts of things. And since we're a content creator platform, we're creating the space for people to, to share what they've learned, what the experts have learned. It's a place for people to go and learn and explore all sorts of different things. Plus it's a place for all the creators to come you know, the experts, the, the teachers and the therapists to come and make their living. And so, uh, yeah. And then, of course, you know, it's starting off in English, but we'll be moving into other languages and then other cultures, too, because each culture has its own unique nuance and difference. Here in Mexico, there's particular nuance and difference for, you know, what sexuality is about, how people feel about it. What are some of the hangups around it? How do people, you know, uh, move through those hangups? What is the best way to guide people through those hangups? As well as in the United States, it's got its own thing. You know, Europe, different countries have their own things. You know, Asia, Japan, uh, you know, all, all around the world, there are different 
kind of subcultures, of course, that have uniqueness and having creators from each of these different areas really gives people access to, um, you know, what speaks to them most directly. And, and um, it, it's really the uh, super, we call it a super brand because it's, it's a place where um, not only are, are the experts, you know, the experts in their area, but it's across many domains, across um, everything from, you know, teachers, healers, and performers. And um, it really incorporates all of the aspects of sexuality and relationships and how to get help if people are feeling like they're lost. And so even though the word gasm really probably triggers like what would be considered a very sexual term, it really is related also to the kind of uh, gasm that one can feel all over, you know, whether it be in your heart or your mind, like, like this is a full body experience. It's not just like down here, it's like all over. And when, when people start to experience those kinds of gasms, like heart and soul gasms, then, you know, people are really expanding beyond kind of what has been presented as what is possible. I want to definitely ask you about the concept of becoming a multi-orgasmic man. And, and I want to also know if, if there is a category in gasm that is devoted to this or it may come you know, in the future when you expand to that level. Um, f- in terms of your, because I, I, I want to ask this uh, question that someone who is totally okay with normal sex, right? Normal, because uh, most guys, they just ejaculate, right? They're, 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 and, and I also want to get into this. How often should a guy ejaculate? And because there are certain formulas in like Taoism or in Mantak Chia and, you know, different categories. So what is your take on ejaculation? Should a person hold it, you know, for, for the rest of their life and like never come ever? And if, and, and also a nuance to that is if they do ejaculate, how to, you know, move it up the spine? and feel that brain gasm instead of the the dick gasm and but before we before i have you answer this question i want to get your thoughts on the role of the woman in a relationship this is big for me because when i was learning about sexuality the gurus and coaches and youtubers and 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 I never went to a sex therapist, but who, you know, whatever I had free access to, they were in the notion that it is you who need to figure it out. It's you. It's your sexuality. It's, you know, you have to do power masturbation. You have to do breath work. You have to increase your testosterone. You have to increase blood flow in, in your body, right? You have to become a, a more present and, and, and be able to meditate and all that. And, and that's totally okay. That's totally fine. But what I learned in my firsthand experience is that the woman has a lot to do with it. I mean, insane amounts to do with it. And so what I've learned is with the right woman, all that is irrelevant. Irrelevant. And so... It's, it's funny because I, I've gone through an entire journey, right, of, of you know, boosting testosterone, doubling testosterone, you know, becoming fit, and, uh, becoming confident and, and providing content and, you know, starting Afro D and this whole thing. But then now I'm with the right woman. So w- did I need to do all that to deserve the right woman or all that was just like, irrelevant it was it was it was it was because from my experience with the right woman all of those deficiencies are like one percent of the game 
And when the bodies match and the chemistries match, the ability to play just arises out of nothing. It's like, it's not that I learned to play, but the energy allowed me to play without even trying to play. It just happened. And it became so easy to play. And it is now, like when I look back at where I was 10 years ago, or even five years ago, or even three years ago, it's like a transformation. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of, I wouldn't give the credit of this transformation to any of that stuff except being with the right woman. Period. So all those guys who can learn from Gasm, the the anatomy and the energies and, and the chakras and 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 how to play, right? How to be in their heart and meditate, you know, the heart and the chi connection. Sure. But then what about being with the right woman? Yeah, great questions. Uh, so much richness in there. Um, I th yeah, I think it's. I think it's. Instead of being mutually exclusive, they're, they're they're you know combinations of. I don't think you as a person necessarily would be the same person having not gone through that experience. Um, I'm sure of it, actually. Right. So, what? So you had a bunch of questions. One's around multi-orgasm <laughs> and, and how many times to ejaculate and how, how to do that. And then also, what does it mean to be with the right person and what is the woman's role? So um, why don't we start with the, um, yeah, the multi-orgasm and uh, talk about ejaculation for a little bit and then we can get into energy and then because like i would say the role of the partner really comes in when you start talking about energy you know we were talking about chemistry and i think a lot of chemistry actually is energy so let's start at kind of what people have been told so people have been told that and maybe not explicitly but implicitly from watching porn that ejaculation is orgasm and that uh, it is, for men, seen as the point of sex. The sad fact of the matter is, is like in most countries, guys ejaculate during intercourse within 10 minutes. The, that's not sad because not that the ejaculation isn't pleasurable. It's sad because it's a fraction of what pleasure could be experienced by learning again, to be present. And it's a moment-to-moment -moment meditation. And sex is this beautiful moment-to-moment -moment meditation, if you make it that. And a lot of it is, again, not necessarily just being an inward meditation, but a heart-opening meditation to be with the one that you're with. And for that to be reciprocated, and that to be a beautiful experience, not only for yourself, but for your partner. Because men have not really learned how to delay their own gratification, again, willpower, men have focused on themselves, they're seen as selfish, and then women end up thinking, what's the point of sex? Because it's not very satisfying. And men see foreplay as a chore when foreplay might as well be you know, a big part of, if not like some of the best parts of sex is all of the foreplay and the buildup and the so on. So we've compartmentalized things into weird kind of categories. What is orgasm? What is foreplay? And um, the vast majority of men have ejaculated a lot. And because we've been told, you know, according to the Western paradigm that we're chemicals and plumbing, we're meat bags, that energy doesn't really exist, right? 
we don't realize that our energy after orgasm is depleted. Oh, we, we get tired, right? But if somebody really tunes into it, it's a big energy depletion. And the fact of the matter is, if you want to look at it at a physical chemical level, you know, stem cells are being uh, um, brought out of bone marrow in order to create sperm. And it takes 63 days to create new sperm. So every time there's an ejaculation, there's like a whole process of, and in Chinese energy medicine, you know, it's jing, you know, jing from the kidneys and, and everything like energy draining. So all of these ejaculations, men have been taught in the West, hey, that's the point of sex. You got to, you know, get your nut off or whatever they call it, right? It's like got to get the nut. <laughs> I think there was, um, I forget which singer that was who says I got to get the nut. But um, Ike Turner used to say, got to get the nut. Um, but um, we've greatly depleted our energy. In fact, it's called the, the million dollar shot in porn because it's almost like we're losing like this very vital resource in our body. It's like we have a hole cut in our pocket and we keep dumping money in and it keeps dropping out because we keep ejaculating. So multi-orgasm is this retraining of the body to learn to become a multi-orgasmic man, which is part of the, the orgasm uh, early curriculum. To become a, a multi-orgasmic man, um, one must learn to slow down. A man needs to learn to slow down. And again, it's about being present. You know, the, the training wheels that I give to people are... Um, when you're getting excited, calibrate your excitement on a scale of zero through 10. And when you get to seven, either pause or slow down dramatically to the degree that you maybe go to eight, but don't go above eight. I say don't go above eight because eight is very close to nine. And I say don't go to nine because nine is very close to 10 and 10 is ejaculation, right? So the thing is with most guys, and this isn't not all guys, but I would probably say like 99% of guys, you hit peak ejaculation and you've got a refractory period for some time. And again, depending upon age, you may have a refractory period of 20 minutes, but it may be as long as hours, right? The refractory period means your body uh, releases prolactin, the erection goes away, right? There is a way of powering through that, but it's a whole technique and I would rather conserve my energy because if you do actually look at the energetics of it, yes, the body does expend a lot of energy creating ejaculate. So if we go with that as a premise, let's experiment. I encourage everybody to experiment, every man to experiment with not ejaculating for some periods of time, first during masturbation by edging, and then by um, slowing down during penetrative sex, when you finally both are ready for penetrative sex, you know, the water has been built up in the fire, um, and the man and the woman are ready for penetrative sex, do it, but do it intentionally and slowly, not the rapid fire machine gun kind of jackhammer style that's depicted in porn, because that is, again, misguiding. And they don't show the cut scenes where the guy slows down. They don't show the scene where either the woman gets fully lubricated beforehand. They don't show a lot. They don't show the guy not being erect, typically. Again, watching porn has a lot of things that can really screw up the mind. And that's actually where sex starts, is it starts in the mind. Sleep starts in the body and the mind. But... Um, Sex starts in the mind. Um, so um, slow down is like the, the principle. And slowing down means being present. Slowing down means knowing how excited you are, knowing at what point you're at the point or getting close to the point of no return and starting to calibrate that. Again, it's training wheels. You don't want to be thinking about it all the time. Once you start like getting beyond the training wheels, you'll It'll become kind of second nature. 
but um, getting to the point where you can kind of, okay, that's a little bit too excited. Let me just slow down a little bit and pause. As far as the woman's role at this at this level of just like physical uh, uh, practice, it's important to in, invite your partner into the experience. And uh, again, I'm generalizing to like heterosexual couples in this situation, but you know we're we're talking specifically about men. We're talking about testosterone. The same would apply in a homosexual relationship, but in a heterosexual relationship, if the point is to slow down, slow down, be present, um, and ask your partner uh, not to move if you're getting to the point of being too close. There's this blues song, I forget exactly how it goes, but it's something like, Slow down, baby, you're cooking too fast, right? So you want to be able to uh, be able to tell your partner, here's what I'm doing. I'm practicing not ejaculating, and it's not any indication of my lack of desire for you. Because that can be also hooked up in, in women's brains, is that if you don't ejaculate for them, they're not hot. They're not attractive. So that's not what's going on. It's that we're extending our pleasure together. And um, when, you in, when you invite them in, then they can understand. So let them know that it's, it's about slowing down, experiencing more pleasure, and that it's about uh, extending uh, the pleasure not only for, for the man, but for the woman. Because intercourse is actually very pleasurable for a woman once it gets beyond the 10 minutes that you know, is the typical but if it's always this, you know, jackhammery type of thing, very little build up, you know, maybe not well lubricated or maybe even hitting the cervix, it can be very painful and irritating. And, and women would be asking, sex is horrible. Why are people talking about sex being good? Right. So, so slow down again and back off to like a seven or a six and then begin again. So that's at the early stages. What ends up happening as one masters this ability to last forever, essentially, and it took me probably nine months of pleasurable practice to be able to like be able to go forever. Um, once you're able to do that, then yeah, you could potentially go for hours if you wanted to. It's basically you have to set a set a time limit. <laughs> like how long you have to get an agreement ahead of time, how long you want to go. It's not to say that there aren't quickies. It's not to say that there aren't, you know, uh, beautiful one hour sessions, but a three hour sex date is a beautiful thing. And um, the the levels of, of bliss and ecstasy that you get to is beyond what you can experience in normal waking state. So if, if these are like levels of consciousness, I feel like we can experience the bliss in physical form, the bliss of enlightenment in physical form through this extended lovemaking. Because all thoughts become like, obviously any thought that shows up in that experience is not happening right now. It's not literally in that moment. So it's just taking, taking the mind is trying to take, uh, you know, the person somewhere else, trying to take me somewhere else. So just go back to that bliss state. But we get to experience that sense of bliss and that sense of connection. And to your point about your partner, like when you are truly um, in love with that partner and experiencing this bliss together, it is an energy that is beyond anything that can be experienced in any other physical form as far as I'm concerned. And that is like our true state of being. If, if we have a material form, that is like the state of enlightenment of bliss in a, in a uh, connected experience to do that with a partner who you aren't really in love with is a lot harder to do that in a relationship 
that is purely about, you know, personal gratification, it's not going to get there. Because as we learn with these different energy centers, moving the energy um, past the heart to a higher state of consciousness requires going through the heart and requires the heart being open. So for people who aren't familiar with the energy centers, there are many, many energy centers in the body, but the seven primary energy centers are, are the root chakra, the sex chakra, the solar plexus, the heart, the throat, what's called the third eye, and then the crown. And a basic principle of energy, and again, you have to take this on faith until you experience it firsthand, because if people haven't experienced tangible energy in their body, which most of us haven't, like I had no idea what any of this was. It sounded like, again, new age cliche until I went through the experiment to cultivate enough energy to be able to do it, it just sounded like cliche. So I had to have enough faith to do enough Qigong to be able to, to feel the energy. But once I started feeling the energy, it was palpable. Um, you can feel it. It feels like, yeah, it feels like an energy ball, but it's, it's detected almost as a sense of pleasure and, um, touch sensation, but there's nothing touching. So, um, so yeah, the whole idea of, of how to, to manipulate your own energy is where your attention goes, energy flows. So if I focus my attention on the sensation of my physical heart, energy and other parts of my body will go there. This is the actual purpose of pain in the body. The purpose of pain is not to say, oh, you're injured. It's like, no, focus your attention on this spot and keep your focused attention there. And this is where energy will go in the body. So and us taking painkillers, we're actually uh, defeating the purpose of pain. But the purpose of pain is that. So, um, um, so when you're experiencing tremendous, say, genital pleasure, if you focus purely on genital pleasure as if, you know, it's like personal gratification, I'm going to like, ah, that's the only place that the energy goes. But if you then are with a partner that you're in love with and you're connected with and they're connected with you and their heart is open, there's a magnifying effect of, of two hearts being open right next to each other. And you can focus your attention on the, the, the sensation in your heart. And the energy from uh, your genitals will move up to your heart. And likewise, you know, sometimes when you're in uh, third eye meditation, you'll be told to focus your attention on your third eye or the spot between your eyebrows. Well, if your heart is open... You're with, you know, a partner that you love and they're in love with you. This energy you can bring up to here. If your heart is close to this person, you're going to be stuck at like, oh, my God, I don't want to be with this person. Right. So casual sex is never casual sex. It may not be heart connected sex, but it's definitely not casual. It's it's still um, it's still a lot of energy and, and it could be creating different energies and different people. So it's like being with people that we're in love with and want to be with, and they want to be with us. Like, obviously that can create this heart opening and from that heart opening energy can come up. And again, that sensation is not necessarily just for us, but when we're focused on this being a practice that we're doing, not just for us in the moment of lovemaking, but so that we can take it out into the world that when lovemaking is over and we've had this blissful connection and this direct experience of bliss and acceptance and love with another being, we can extend without necessarily physical intimate relations, but we can extend that experience of connection to others. And so it is, it becomes a deeply healing experience to bring out into the world outside the bedroom, having had that experience in the bedroom. 
as far as multi-orgasm goes, the whole idea is that orgasm isn't just in the genitals. Orgasm is all over the body. And as, um, you know, if this were like a, a, a graph of like the amount of energy in an, an ejaculatory orgasm in 10 minutes, it would be like that, right? If you learn to not peak orgasm, if you learn to what's called valley orgasm, um, but have a full body orgasm, allow the energy to move to the rest of the body without peaking, meaning go up to seven, back off to six, go up to seven, back off to six, and so on for, for a long, long time, that the total amount of energy that you will experience will go way, way, way above what would be this little peak orgasm. And that energy going to the whole body is healing for the whole body. Because as we discussed earlier, just like there's this physical body and then this energetic body and emotional body and mental body, um, pleasure is energy. Pleasure is, you know, energy. And by moving it to those places in the body that have experienced stagnation, you will bring rejuvenation to that part of the body. We focus on the chemicals, we focus on pharmaceuticals and all of that, but there is an energetic layer of the body that's affected by emotions and pleasure to the whole body will bring energy to the whole body and you literally can heal things with tremendous amounts of pleasure. So um, I've touched on a lot there. How about? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for all that. Um, you mentioned... Some, when you were talking about gasm, you mentioned play, and this is a this is a huge topic. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Yak Pengsap. He's um, Yak Pengsap. He's a professor researcher, and he basically spent his entire life studying play in animals. And his theory was that just like humans play, animals play too. So he developed this technique where he would tickle rats. And uh, you have to do it like with intention and you have to believe in it because the lab downstairs was trying to replicate his experiments and they couldn't get the rats to play. So they called Yak downstairs and then he would, you know, he would engage it, play with them and they would, you know, get the right activation. And uh, I don't know how much you listen to Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson's concept of, of you know, this walled garden as a, a perfect place to play and be yourself and be free but it is walled because you want to feel secure and you want to feel secure in this uh in this you know the the walls sort of allow you to be yourself and be free so and then there's another uh concept that jordan peterson taught me is that the sort of nemesis or antidote to totalitarianism is voluntary play and this is sort of the, the spirit that can cure the world, that cure humanity, just the voluntary play. And I don't really see play much in people, especially as we get older, right? This, this concept of, hey, you can dance wherever you want. You can uh, smile to people. You can uh, make jokes at people. And, 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 and even if people get offended, I mean, it's kind of funny, like, why are you taking yourself so seriously, right? So there's a sense of play. So how does, how could GASM, and we can even brainstorm here, right, for things maybe you haven't developed in the app yet. How can, how can we take the spirit of play and make it, use it to liberate people sexually? Because this play aspect was something that was deeply missing in me, right? I would have this responsibility that I have to perform this, this amount or for this long, or I have to satisfy the girl in this way, right? And it's almost like she has to brag to her friends about me, right? This was like the, 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 the vibe of the whole thing. Right. And now that I'm able to play, it's so automatic and natural and it just flows without any thought. So, and, and, and I'll be honest with you, man, I think I'm just lucky. I just got extremely lucky somehow because 
the people I watch in the world, the people that I interact with, colleagues or friends or relatives, I don't think they get it. So either I got really lucky or there are certain genes inside me that turned on through an environmental interaction. And, and, and I was just because of my personality, I'm able to feel those things. So regardless of personality, regardless of genetics, regardless of getting lucky, how can gasm allow a man to become a, a player, you know, like, it, 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 like just, just play and have fun. Play, play and have fun different than a player, sure. right? But um, yeah, again, it's the science of play that comes into, and, and I think you were talking about one of the researchers who, who does that with animals and there are other animals, I think it's dogs and maybe even bears who will play with each other, like polar bears who would not otherwise eat a dog will go and play with the dog. Um, when the dog goes down to downward dog, that's the sign of let's play. And so there, there are like visual cues of like how animals will enter into play. And um, I think one of obviously the challenges like you experienced in your earlier relationships was that, you know, there's all this fear of consequence of entering into play. Oh, I'm not cool enough. Or she's going to complain that I was acting goofy or stupid or whatever. And so gasm is this, again, it's kind of this safe playground for people to go and play with people at whatever level of, uh, um, um, kind of revealing themselves that they want. Right. But imagine, um, you know, imagine that you want to learn how to be more playful in the bedroom. What if you could have that in a chat dialogue with somebody who is ready to do that too, right? You don't always necessarily find people who are ready to do that. What if you wanted some ideas on how to talk dirty? Like, that's a fun thing to do. What is talking dirty? And how do you do that in a way that you know, respects the other person and doesn't go across some sort of boundary that they might have. Um, so being able to do that in a way where it's like, okay, let's play a game. Like, okay, what game are we going to play? Well, let's go play the game of, you know, doctor and patient, right? That's a fun role play game. Or let's go play truth or dare. Like I want to go and like answer some intimate questions about what was it like for you the first time? you know, and being able to reveal things that are revealing, but then there's also a fun play aspect because you're also learning from the other person, you know, and it's like, do you want a truth or a dare? Hmm. All right, give me a dare. Like, what's that? Okay, what, what can you come up with? And so we offer different suggestions and people can take those suggestions and then we create different spaces for people to have different kinds of play. But yeah, always interested in hearing what people have in, in terms of ideas for what kind of ideas would be fun to play uh, in the bay, the bedroom and, and um, even outside the bedroom, just in conversation, even with friends. Like, what if we could become better friends by understanding like each other better and some of the things that tripped us up maybe as teenagers or things that we're learning now? about, you know, how to relate to women, right? And it's always considered like, oh my God, taboo. I can't show somebody like I'm looking at porn. We want Gasm to be that thing that it's like, hey, check out Gasm. Like there's some really cool things for you to check out here. And it's something that guys could share with other guys. Women could share with other women and, and so on. Uh, share Everybody share with their friends and have conversations about it because it is time, you know, the world is waking up. We've all just been in lockdown for how many years? And then we've come out of that. It's like, we want deeper connections. We want to get it beyond this, like weirdness and porn. We want to have better, you know, consent conversations. You know, what is a consent conversation? How do you even have that conversation? People want to explore different kinds of relationship styles. Maybe I don't feel like uh, I want to be monogamous. What does that mean? How do I even explore what that means? Like, how does somebody even be, go from monogamy into something else? 
Or how does one even communicate better in monogamy? Like I want to, I want monogamy, but I don't want to be frustrated, you know? Um, and then back to these questions of like um, chemistry and, and how to get to know somebody, you know, uh, one's turn ons and one's desires and do that in a way where it's not like, list me your desires, you know, okay, I've taken your desires, but make it something that's fun, right? Make it a, I've, I've done this where I've gone through uh, like BDSM checklist. And there are some crazy things in these BDSM checklists, like eight pages of like possible acts that you could do together. It is hilarious to go through that with a partner or a potential partner. And it's like, what do you think about this? It's like, wow, you've got to be kidding. People do that. You know, it's like, yeah, why not? That's kind of a turn on. You know, why not? You know, and it becomes this fun revealing with, again, with it being in the context of play, like, yeah, life is too important to be taken so seriously. Right. And yeah, there's a big opportunity for people to let go of that shame and that fear and that guilt that we've been experiencing our lives that have kind of like put us in this tight little box that like, Oh my God, I can't even move. Like I can't even do anything without somebody judging me for being whatever. It's like, I can be me. I can be fully out and expressive and who I am in a big way. And it'd be okay because you know what? That's who I am. And it's a, it's a whole process, a whole shedding of these fears and realizing that there is more energy on the other side. And, and, you know, there are these books like, um, learn how to not give a fuck or whatever, you know, you've seen those books and, and, um, the, or the war of art and, and things like that, where basically we are these creator beings, but all of these shoulds have gotten us into this tight little spot we can easily break out of all of that. And Gasm, that's the intention with Gasm, is to like break, break open all of these walls, these creative walls, these walls around our intimacy, around our pleasure, around what turns us on, you know, things that we would consider, oh my God, I've got that weird desire. Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. As long as, you know, nobody else is getting hurt by it, you know, it's okay. You know, and there are ways of playing with that turn on. And why do I have that turn on? I don't know, but I do. It's interesting. But we can play with it in a responsible way that respects others and is ethical. And why not play with it and, and see where that energy takes, where that energy takes us and where that goes. Mm. So um, one final topic I want to explore with you is um, something you just mentioned, and I have it written down uh, in my notes, and we haven't touched upon it yet, but it's the concept of polygamy and, mono and, and you know, polyamory and monogamy and so on. So th this is a, a deep and intense topic because, I mean, even like in the Quran, right, which, which Muslims uh, follow, it says um, uh, you can marry two or three or four women. And then it says, as long as you can love them all the same. So people don't really read that other line. It's just like, oh, I can marry, I can have four wives, right? That's sort of the, the, the thing. And obviously I'm paraphrasing and there's millions of translations of the Quran. So, you know, forgive me if I'm uh, misrepresenting it, but this is what I've learned. So there is this uh, aspect of having multiple wives and there's um, an Islamic culture in the Sharia. They have this thing called where uh, it's sort of like you can, you can have a wife for a contract, like a, a certain, like a year or six months. And it's sort of like a girlfriend, but it's like a, a contract. So it, it's like allowed in the law, but even an Islamic tradition can allow for certain things like that. You know, it's, it's, it's like, hey, you can be devoted to one woman or you have all these multiple options that, you know, especially if you have money, and you have the means to do that, you can do that. Now, my question is, I mean, all that is fine, but the, the, when you look at monogamy, 
and being devoted to one woman your whole life, and especially if you have kids with her, and you want to form this family relationship versus an open relationship or, or polyamory where you are kind of splitting the love or splitting the soul or splitting connection. How do you juggle this? Because I know you've been in both types of relationships, right? You've been married at least twice, I know. Um, and you have kids, or oh, you have four kids. So how do you, how do you manage these different mindsets? And how do you reconcile love? Because to me, because I, and, and again, this also has to do with the way you're brought up, right? So I was brought up with a mom and dad who are still married, right? And they, they're happy. They, you know, as, as far as I know, you know, they, uh, we spend a lot of time together. I call them. Obviously, there's fights and where isn't a uh, fight? But they, I, I saw a very loving and, and connected, fun, beautiful relationship as I grew up. So now in my life, I want the same thing. And when I was, you know, in my pickup days uh, with RSD and, and, you know, talking with all the, all, the, all, the, all the guys and living in Vegas and all that, it was not that at all. It was more like, hey, I'm going to have a harem and I'm going to have like multiple women and, you know, it's, it's, I'll be able to like uh, uh, still live a fulfilling life and somehow the kids will figure it out. And, and, and somehow they'll be happy and free and, and loving uh, beings on earth. I didn't even go that far. It was more like a, it was a very selfish thing. Like, hey, I'm going to be able to do this and, and just do this like Hugh Hefner, like for the rest of my life till I die. Until I touched my first loving relationship, which is the one I'm in now. And now it's like, this is amazing. So, 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 so the question is, someone who wants an open relationship or polyamory, is it just that they've never loved or they weren't lucky enough to fall in love? Or is it that they just have a different genetics, a different personality? They have a different, maybe transgenerational, a hereditary, you know, passing of 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 traits what's going on here yeah all all good questions i don't think there's any single answer obviously so um yeah i think all of those could be true for different people right so there could be people who um, are avoidant anxious avoidant or av avoidant uh anxiety disorders what is it called um avoidant attachment styles. And so they're, you know, exiting a relationship to go into another relationship to go into another relationship. I think there are, um, and, and anxious and avoidant tend to go together. And so they're like common people who have a secure attachment style. When they arrive with another person who has a secure attachment style, it's easier for them to settle into a secure attachment style. And it's not that everybody's 100% of one and 0% of another. It's that there's probably different variations and it probably changes over time. Um, yeah, my parents were together uh, until my mom passed away. And yeah, they would have fights. And I just thought that was like part of what a relationship was about. But I think there are also situations where... Um, and I'll speak from firsthand experience. And like I said, I think all the, all of what you described as possibilities are probably true for different people, right? There are probably, for me, the way I am now is I feel that um, love is caring for a person and there's like, it doesn't have to be one person. It could be one person. But to expect one person to be to meet all of my relationship needs would be a lot to put on that one person. And I am um, 
I've been in long relationships. I've had, you know, 14 years, you know, with my first wife. I've had seven years with my second wife, including like dating as well as then marriage. So it's not like I haven't been in long relationships and, and, but I've always felt like, um, there is an attraction to other people that um, instead of being like cheating or wanting to go and cheat, which something like 60% of men and 40% of women cheat in monogamous relationships, instead of lying about it, I just want to be open about it. So in my second marriage, I was it was an open relationship. Definitely polyamory and monogamy each have their own challenges. But I feel like what I experience and what I can give and receive changes from person to person. And while I do love long-term relationships that are deep and maybe even lifetime, I feel like my truest nature is that I, I'm not going to do that with one person. And that there are other people who are like me, who uh, some of I've, I've found and others that I've you know yet to find, who are the same. And there's no judgment about like one being the right way and the other being the wrong way. But um, it's whether we're mature about it or we're immature about it. And by mature, I mean um, transparent. Everybody knows what's going on. And um, we talk about it. So some of the skills that come with polyamory that are kind of base level required for polyamory could really be beneficial for everybody to learn just in terms of transparency of communication, learning, you know, what, what, you know, a partner wants and needs, not just in the bedroom, but in life. So it kind of enforces a deeper sense of honesty and um, difference of life, you know, different life kind of needs and desires. Polyamory also acknowledges that we can love multiple people and love is not bound to like one person. And again, not to say that monogamy with like devotion to one person isn't beautiful because I find that beautiful as well. It's just what is in one's nature, back to that, you know, Marcus Aurelius, you know, uh, idea of what is one's nature. So I've experimented with both, and I've really come to the conclusion that my truest nature is to be um, deep in terms of, like, connection, but also realize that I can love multiple people. And if the people that I'm with want to be with me and be with other people for themselves or, or just know that I'm with multiple people and then it's okay. If they don't want to be, if they don't want me to be with multiple people or they don't want to be with multiple people, well, if they don't want me to be with multiple people, then yeah, definitely. Um, whether they want to be with multiple people is up to them. Um, but I usually find that, yeah, people who, like, I don't have a restriction, like, oh, okay, it's just me and, like, five women, you know? Um, like, if they want to be with other women or other men, that's totally fine. Like I said, love to me is boundless, unconditional, and um, accepted. So, uh, you know... Even if a partner says, okay, well, I've done this polyamory, but I really want to be with this one person. That's what their heart desires. Like, I can't, I'm not the one to tell them, no, you can't do this. You know, um, it's, it's in their nature and that's, that's what they feel is the best for them at this time. So we do change over time and it's being able to communicate those changes you know, in my first relationship, I felt like we really had grown apart. Um, we had obviously, you know, as every marriage does, a lot of challenges or some challenges. And but our, our life vision was diverging. And I was going 
kind of towards more kind of deep introspection and figuring out my life purpose. And, you know, in hindsight, knowing what I know now, I probably would have handled the situation differently, may have ended up in the same place, but it feels like, yeah, sometimes relationships, we grow apart. And I love hearing stories about couples when they've stayed together their entire lives. And that's a beautiful thing too. I mean, different forms of art. These are all different forms of art. We're all different kinds of creators. Let's embrace the diversity, see what, you know, is the best for us, but do it with love and care, right? You know, um, if a relationship comes together, do it with care. If a relationship, you know, goes apart, do it with care. And yeah, honor and accept each other as, you know, what they feel is in their highest. Got it. Yeah. Great to know that. Yeah, man. The, the thing you said about art and everyone's a creator and creating their own art. Beautiful, man. Now in present day with Gasm, yeah. where, where do we stand? Like what's the, can people already register? Can they already see the app? They can, you know, get the, the education, they can play meet therapists what where's the current state yeah we are people can go to our website gasm.life and sign up for early access they'll get access to our uh, newsletters which are coming out uh several times a month can get access to our instagram which also has some of the educational components in it so there's like components of education that started in socials and then end up leading into the app the app is not launched yet so that's still uh you know uh kind of secret a little bit you know what's behind the curtain a little bit of an idea from this conversation but um yeah coming out this this summer and yeah it's going to wow. be exciting and um yeah people who are interested in being creators can can go to our website um early access to the app and yeah we're also you know as true with every startup, we're always raising money. So if anybody has any um, interest in, in this particular area, we're looking for strategic investors who are committed to this, not just like uh, just money, but um, people who really feel passionate about this because this is really an impact business. Where we're taking this is well beyond, you know, sex education. And um, it's something that, yeah, is, is very much needed in the world. And, and we want people on board who are invested in that. Wow. So, Douglas, thank you so much for coming mm. all the way from Merida. Um, love to, seeing you, man. To do this. Um, yeah, man, from the very beginning, since we met at Digital Jungle, like I, I knew this was something, mm. uh, you know, a real connection. Mm. Just, you know, seeing you every day, seeing you hustle mm. and just... To, you know, even our, my very first talk with you, you were at my place in uh, the Asan Lam and uh, we had this discussion, you know, you showed me those uh, exercises with the, with the wrist. Right. Um, I remember, and it, it, you've helped me so much, so much support, you know, relationship wise and, and um, just, you know, sexuality wise and, and just being a good person and being in the heart and, and full of love and, and beauty. So, Thank you so much, buddy. I love you, brother. And, uh, yeah, you've always been um, a solid rock for me, and I've I've really loved our friendship. And yeah, look forward to many, many, many more conversations. Yeah, and and best of luck with Gasm. Um, if if I can do anything, you know, let me know. We would love uh, Afro D to be for sale as a product, not at launch, but yeah, when we open our shop, we would love Afro D to be in there, and for you know maybe educational components from your educators to be there how to maximize testosterone and yeah let's let's see where we take it let's, let's make it happen thank awesome, you buddy brother. thank you